It is Monday, and it July was the, 23rd, what are the 2018. This is Radio Oh, show. man. Show. I'm Ghost. Yeah. His grief Dan is going to be... It's going to... Danny Oakers. Probably, I mean, that's... That ain't... And we went all the 30 way. years of Gorgeous being therapy George for that one. Here. Wow, I almost wore a shirt just like George's today. That is stupid. <laughs> that's super sad. Stupid. Yeah, so hate that today, man. Let him out. Bring him on. Ricky, can you throw your headset real quick? We're going to do a little mic check on you. This is the pre-show, by the way. So don't say Show anything you wouldn't want millions of people to hear. Oh, yeah. yeah. Check, that's check. Stuff. Or you know what I mean? Or check, me. check. How's he sound, Danny? Can you say that one more time? One, two, one, two. Sounds good. This is Ricky Lundell. That sounded okay. like the worst you rap this ever. No. I know. One, two, <laughs> two, <laughs> two this is Ricky Lundell. <laughs> Well, I didn't get to the good stuff yet. Yeah. I was about to throw <laughs> some compound syllable <laughs> rhymes in there, but I just kind of slowed it down. I didn't want to lose my 30. fire on the you didn't want to pre-show. Venom. <laughs> pre-show he's Venom loss. Yeah, he's saving it for the real show. See, he understands. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I'm right there with it's you. It's a media game. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> you guys are coming up. Stand by. We are making our descent into Las Vegas McCarran Airport. On behalf of our crew, we'd like to thank you for flying MMA Junkie Airlines. Now please fasten your seatbelts and put your tray tables in your upright position because the descent is going to be a little bit bumpy. <laughs> All right, Junkie Nation, it's time to roll, baby, on MMA Junkie Radio with gorgeous George and Go. This is what we do and why we do it, baby. All night long. We roll yes! The MMA Junkie Radio Revolution is upon us. Can you dig it? There's no escape. No escape. Through the vast frontier of cyberspace and through a sea of stars in outer space. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. We've solidified our combat communication stranglehold. We are controlling transmission. With the use of MMA Junkie Radio and Sirius XM satellite radio technology. MMA Junkie Radio. Commence transmission. Live from MMA Junkie Radio HQ in the fight capital of the world. Las Vegas, Nevada. Here are your hosts, Gorgeous George and Goes. From the fight capital of the world, inside the beautiful Mandalay Bay Racing Sportsbook, you are listening to the MMA Junkie Radio Show, the only show that matters. I'm your host, Gorgeous George. With me, as always, is the devious and dastardly Goes. Our East co-host, to my left, it's the fight analyst, Dan Tom. Back East at the Sirius XM Studios, producing, as always, it's Danny Otto and our special guest co-host for the day, Ricky Lundell, noted head coach, noted assistant head coach, and... Of MMA and in the world of wrestling, he is Bishop Gorman's head red, uh, head wrestling coach. How you doing? Good to have you back, guys. I'm uh, I'm so glad to be back on your guys' show and and chatting with you guys. It's been a it's been a little while. Yeah, probably like eight months or something. It has been. Ryan Benoit was on the show last time, I think. Yeah. And so so it's been a little bit. He's got a fight now. He does. He's got a fight coming up. I'm excited about that one. How have you been? Dude, I've, guys, I've been awesome. It was great yeah. to run into you the other day at the World MMA Awards and. Yeah, wasn't that a great event? That I mean, was very cool. It was. It was a really great event. I thought they did a really good memorial show during it. Uh, the big John McCarthy's thing was very, very nice. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was it was special, I thought, to see see him him given the props that he really deserves for what he's done for the world of MMA. So I I had a lot of fun out there. Yeah, in their first edition, which wasn't an award show, it was just awards given through the magazine. Yes. He had received the lifetime achievement, and so they wanted to honor him again, kind of in that setting. So I thought it was cool. And now that he's retired from refing, he could come back. You never know. But it sounds like he's retired. <laughs> in and this game of MMA. <laughs> right. He, uh, uh, you know, it was a good time to maybe acknowledge that because he had – you know, quite an achievement as an mem- MMA referee, as a pioneer in the setting the rules, you know what I mean? And getting this thing going, making it legal, running and embracing regulation instead of running away from it. Totally. He was right there. He was one of the ones. Yeah, he's had his hand in almost sport. everybody's camp at some point or another. He's been in 
almost every corner and every in in everybody's in everybody's uh, experience inside of MMA. I mean, he was inside of my experience when I was only maybe ten years old. I met John McCarthy for the first time. Ten years old? Yeah. Oh wow! Because I started jujitsu. Uh, I met him in California. He was he was training out there and uh, was just kind of getting into jujitsu, uh, and and I had started training in 1992 under Pedro Sauer, and that was directly under the Gracies, and so uh, John McCarthy came through and and he was just kind of just this big guy, and they were like, oh, this is our ref, you know, he's our UFC ref, and I shook his hand, and this has been man 22 years ago that I met this guy. And, and it's funny now to, like, look at how much has happened inside of 22 years in this sport. It seems, seems like, uh, for me, because I'm young, it's a lifetime ago. But really, 22 years is, is not very much time for this sport to go from where it was to the very, very top. No doubt. And he's been there since UFC, UFC 2. two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, with he was Joe at Silva. UFC 1 as a training partner, mm -hmm. at UFC 2 as a referee. Joe Silva made it. I want to say eight or so. Leon Tabs, UFC one, right, guys? UFC one. One or two? No, one. Yeah, Joe Silva, I remember I heard had one of those yellow um, yellow pads yes. you know, that, that teachers have and things like that. Yes. He had pages and pages filled with notes. And after he saw UFC one, he sent that in to um, – uh, Art Davey and Campbell McLaren and those guys right. got their attention. They just thought he was like a super fan, you know, like, oh, my God, this is pages and pages of notes, how he felt they could improve or what he liked, and, and then I guess he stayed on the radar. And I want to say within the first dozen shows, he somehow had a role because Art Davey was a matchmaking and then a guy named John Peretti, and then we get to, I guess, the, the Joe Silva era at some point. You know? Yeah, I mean, and Joe, Joe Silva, it, he, was, he was a super fan because he was so into – the old martial art movies. He oh was yeah. he was huge into like I into all the Bruce Lee movies. But then then watching John Claude Van Damme and and just these different movies that had come out about karate and about about how to, how to just fight. And he was he was trying to learn how to fight. He was a smaller guy trying to learn how to how to strike and do different things. So then when he was really watching the UFC for the first time, he's like, oh my gosh, this is martial arts really happening out here right mm -hmm. like it's really happening martial it's arts for real for real like this isn't this fake like we're going to a karate tournament right. or anything like that so joe joe and i have sat down and had like numerous talks and every time we're having a talk he brings up an old martial art movie that used to inspire him which brought him to the era that he's in today how how martial arts movies like really shaped the world of ufc yeah. what's your favorite martial arts movie um you know i it's is as funny as it sounds it's like I, I went into the martial arts side of everything i i loved i loved under siege just because yeah it was it was awesome yeah the, the guns and the the i saw a smile on her face i did yeah, i loved it like he good. threw the knife it's and like the gall on that that ship yes under on siege. the sh on the ship okay remember uh and they the Tommy Lee Jones takes over the ship, and he has to like. Some chick pops out of a cake. Yeah, at the end yeah, that my uh, that always got covered up. You know, <laughs> my mom would always be like, "Dog, you gotta shut your eyes, cover your eyes." Uh -huh. Somehow, we'd always, for some reason, that the part steel. of the tape was like yeah. right. really worn down. Whenever she'd come home from work, that part was really <laughs> screwed up. No, but I we did. I loved that movie. Uh, decoys. What you do is when you know that part's coming up, yes. you go, Mom, I think the dryer just went off or something like that. And then she gets up. She goes, <laughs> <out of> the <laughs> room, but I said, it's all good. That was a smooth yeah. move. Hey, I also, I mean, I also loved the Rocky series, but I loved the heart inside the Rocky series. I mean, it was more, to me, it wasn't the martial arts inside the Rocky series, but, but what he was promoting. And I, I think, I, think I, uh, I really related with those, with that show more than any other martial art movie that ever came out, and I know everybody's got their own, Are we but Rocky was just... Rocky was amazing. It was amazing. Are we allowed to throw in movies like The Warriors or like... I th uh, I think so. I was surprised. If a fight took place, sure. Right? What were you going to say, Dan? I was going to say, I, I was surprised he didn't throw in something like uh, Vision Quest. I don't think Vision Quest yeah. gets enough love. That's like the wrestler's Rocky, right? Yeah, Vision Quest doesn't get a lot of love. Yeah. I, I mean, it is it is the it is the uh, the Rocky for wrestlers. But, you know, I, I think they needed to do a little bit more in Vision Quest to really 
showcase what wrestling is. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. You know, like they had a lot of that, a lot of that like '80s. Let's force a, a weird love story in here. Yes, <laughs> a lot of the, yes. Took, probably took away from the wrestling aspect. I think so. I think if they really got into the heart of what wrestling is, I mean, they would have got deeper into the fans. I think they did a better job on the ESPN, the the Iowa documentary for wrestling. Have I you guys seen ever that. seen no, that? Oh no. Oh man, Steve Mako's in it actually. So like for Steve, Iowa. For, for Iowa, yep. He wrestled for the Hawkeyes. Cowboy? He is, and he defected oh. from, from <laughs> Iowa Hawkeyes and <laughs> went to the Cowboys. Okay. So he, he, uh, he left Iowa after he took second there and then, and then went off to, to the Cowboys. But, but this, this show shows like what it really is to wrestle in college at that kind of a level, and you see the intensity and what they're dealing with. Kale Sanderson's in it at Iowa State, and he, he battles one of their Iowa boys and just – dismantles him and then they see you see him have the kid have a total breakdown goes in the back he's punching walls and and freaking out and tom brands who's the head coach at iowa comes out and he's like you know this guy's this guy's the total package like you have to go out there and wrestle like the total package but it didn't matter to him that kale sanderson was the total package we look at kale sanderson now and like daniel cormier looks at him and he's like that's the greatest wrestler of all time but it didn't matter to this kid. This kid was crying, hitting lockers, screaming. Doesn't matter. But how close was I expected the, to win. Match? Oh, it wasn't close. Oh, okay. I mean, it was. <laughs> it was probably. I mean, it it might have been a tech fall from what wow. I remember. Okay, right? I mean, it was almost like. Were you almost the guy? Or what was yeah, it like I mean, seven, eight, three to four. Y- no, it was just like you got blown. It out. was just like Cal Sanderson, you know. And they at the time, I think it was Cal's second year, so. They didn't know who he was. What they was didn't the know what was happening. What was the name of this documentary? So it's the Iowa, Iowa. Hawkeye ESPN documentary. Okay, I'm going to check this out. And this is back okay. in 1999, something like that. Did okay. you like Cobra Kai? Uh, the the actual gym or the... No, the, the <laughs> remake YouTube thing that they did. I didn't see it. You haven't seen it? Did you like the Karate Kid? I love the Karate Kid. Dude. Who I love the Karate, like the karate kid. kid. Yeah, they should be. You man, can't say they that. They gotta be booted. Say you haven't watched Cobra Kai. You gotta watch Cobra Kai. Where where do I see okay, it? Okay, it came out on YouTube. Okay, and they're all adults, obviously. Um, so this is like the original the John road. Lawrence and the original Daniel Larusso. So that's Ralph Macchio and William Zabka. Y- yes. Um, along with a few other characters, come back and they have new roles, and it's a ten-part series. I think each episode's about thirty minutes long. It's on YouTube Red. Oh, I'm First month's this. free, so awesome. if you binge, you can cancel. <laughs> Otherwise, you can stay with YouTube and then not I have to go through those commercials. Then I will binge. Into street mm-hmm. fights and hooligan fights and things like that on YouTube <laughs> that keep me up all night. Right. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, it. Aren't some of those street fights just horrific? They uh, are. But they're they are horrific. Like, sometimes just, they're all the ones are like are when a Instagram. bad guy gets checked. Oh, totally. You know, that's, so I love when the ones where the compilation him. says, he never expected that. You know, <laughs> yeah, <or something laughs> totally. He, he pushed the wrong guy's buttons. So oh, oh, yeah. Man, I'll watch those for hours. There's some guy, like, covered in tattoos, and he's, like, punking some guy, and then all of a sudden the guy's in a karate stance, and he, like, spinning back kicks him. Yeah. I've seen a couple of those where I've just been like, Wow. I didn't expect that. Like, where did this guy come from? Jiu-jitsu, man, in, in <laughs> some street fights, too. Beautiful jiu-jitsu. The ones that come from Hawaii, wow, they, they're like, it's almost an MMA fight, except it's on grass or a gravel. Or so pretty. Sometimes you see some of them where you're, like, feeling bad for both people. The hair is never let go of. Man. Somebody's punching from above. The clothes. I'm always like, oh, the clothes. you got to walk home in that now. Yes. <laughs> Just the shame yeah. of, like, having to leave that situation. And they got the camera. But I, I know. But I really wish they oh. would just go to a park. And 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 just do that do that there. I don't like to see it in the street. Sometimes there's cars moving by and everywhere. Yeah, they're tripping over things. Yeah, weird things are going do, on. Do you guys like the uh, like old drunk guy fights that are just terrible, but oh. you know somebody might get clipped, so you just watch it and it's really bad. <laughs> Have you seen the those. Family where Guy episode yeah, like where that stuff. happens? When he fights a chicken? No, no, no. So there's a Family Guy episode where it's, a, it's an it's an old American w- like World oh, War Two vet <laughs> and an old old <laughs> Nazi. And in yeah. town, they're like they get in this fight, and it is so slow. Like they're like trying to punch each other, and it's like <laughs> yes. this speed. Yes. And then they're like <laughs> falling down, yeah, and the, so the fight like so never good. ends. It's like that. If you see cobblestone <laughs> roosters and two drunk guys. 
I'm in. That's the that's Those the, the good that's fights. gonna keep you up at night. Oh, yeah, Lately, yeah, yeah. what I've been seeing is subways. <laughs> so a lot of people subways. Well, the subways are different now. The subways people used to just sit. Sandwich shop or the no the the subways the moving train. Sandwich shops got fights too. Do they? Yes. Well, I know <laughs> Denny's alone, McDonald's, Walmart. I mean, you can binge on all those. But subways before was just sit in your seat and maybe put on your headphones and mind your own business, right? Uh, I guess you, I don't know if you hit. I've never. I've only ridden on a subway once. So what do I know? Yeah, pull, yeah. tap, or something. I remember the old pull string. That's a bus. Yeah, yeah, right. But I forgot. I was on a bus with Danny. How do you get off the subway? It, does it just stop? Does it stop just stop? I thought it just stopped. Yeah. It has it has frequent stops, Danny's and then you have to Danny's get off. Danny be watching you porn or something like that. <laughs> Danny, uh, hello? Oh, I didn't, know, I didn't know you were trying to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I was Danny. You, you answer to Danny, right? <laughs> I heard you were on the subway. <laughs> you were we were on, on a subway together like, about oh, a year okay. ago. How, it just stops automatically, right? It doesn't matter if we... If, if people request that or not, <laughs> there's no requesting stops on, right, so on yeah. the subway. Yeah, it just has a certain certain amount of stops. So now on subways, the right there's like performers, but then there's also oh yeah. people that are just they start tripping out on people. And if you just hit fights on subway, you'll be there for hours. Really? Yeah. yeah. And there's good guys saying stop it already, you know. And then there'll be a bunch of uh, people that that just like a village. They just take them down and throw them off, and, uh, and they'll be done with that fight. And then there's people just. Yeah, and uh, you know, like the performers get on the people's nerves. There'll, there'll be guys like doing like almost like stripper pole, stripper pole stuff, except <laughs> yes. it's more of the form of gymnastics. <laughs> and then they come around and ask for money. But sometimes they're playing the radio, or sometimes they get pissed if you don't tip, or sometimes people just don't want to see it. Or so they they'll try pay. to punk them or something, and like yeah, that or, or fight starts. Yeah, or or others are just what are you looking at? Why are you wearing that? Speak English on this train? I mean, anything, anything you can think of. Fights are happening on subways. Right. It's kind of like that Amber Lamps video where that, you know, that old, that old, uh, like, I don't know what war he was in, probably Vietnam, when that guy, like, came up to punk him and he was that older guy on the bus. He gets up and he, he starts just boxing him to death. Oh, I know. Do you guys remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Amber what? It, the guy, uh, It has, like, this whole thing, Amber Lamps, because the, cause the guy sits down and he's like, they're like, are you okay? Are you okay? To this, to this kid who was trying to punk this old guy. Yeah. And he's, he's like. Don't touch me. Like, get away from me. And he, like, keeps touching him. So he gets up, and he just, like, like straight down the pipe. Just like, bang, 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 bang. And the kid sits down, and he's like, you got to call it Amber Lamps. Amber Lamps. So they tied it to that song, Amber Lamps. Oh, I have to look that yeah, one I know yeah. you've seen this Really? Video. You okay. have to have yeah, seen this right. video. Whatever, this is, like, this is, I mean, this might be bigger than Tito Ortiz, Chuck Liddell 1 on, online. I mean, this yeah. is a big-time video. Wait, wait. It's very well known. It's up there with Sharkeisha. I'm Ooh. bad. I f- I'm feeling bad then that I missed this one. I'm like scrambling through my phone now. How did how did I miss this one? Do you know who Sharkeesh is? No, I'm. You know I, who I am the is? oldest. I am the oldest 32 year old that looks like he's 22 years old that you'll ever meet. <laughs> yeah, but Sharkeesh, um, it's one of the biggest beat viral, you'll right? Ever see. Yeah. Bus driver uppercut. You've heard of that one? I gotta see. I gotta kick. Ke- it's like I want to say I gotta catch up on this, but I don't know now. I think I'm too. I'm too desensitized to violence. Because back to what you said about the no commercials thing, that wouldn't be a hook for me. Because now I think I'm, I'm, I'm watching so many fights that first of all I can, I can tell you what the skip ad says in Russian and all these things from having to go to their servers to pull up fights. I feel like I, I'm like, oh, I can start speaking other languages at least if it says skip ad. But I almost look forward to the commercials now. I'm like, ah. Oh, Breaks from the violence. I can go grab a sandwich. I can go go to the bathroom. Ah, uh, okay. So I'm like wired a little different. So, but uh, I will put these on my list because these, if these are uh, you know social phenomena, like you guys are saying, I I need to I need to be up on that. So, yeah. Dan, these are very well known okay. fights. These right. are very important you fights. All right, I put this on there. So many times in this fight, <gasps> it's just a straight right hand, and it, it like like Leota me like Leota from Goodfellas. Like that many repeat rights. These, boom, over and over. You want to describe these two are, and these two are three is, feet tall. Yeah, and every time he does it, he has like a Mike Tyson's punch out reaction, like his head goes <laughs> <along, laughs> like that. Every time, like same punch. You <laughs> want to describe what your action? A lot of people don't know what you're doing. Uh, it's a uh, Muay Thai Sharkisha. fight with uh, dwarfs. Hmm. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just one guy keeps. Getting they're not. The they're not five years shot. old. What I'm no, watching no, no, right no. now. Look, he even almost went through the ropes. The same this is punch. I don't get two it. Two five-year-olds fighting for a chicken. Yeah. Dwarf fight. No. I have never heard of that one. Okay. I've seen dwarf fights, but I just didn't know you could just Google that. And <laughs> <do it. laughs> we were you got put on a list when, we when you Googled yeah. that right there. You got you put on a yeah. list. <laughs> Denny, Denny's has good fights. <laughs> Denny's? <laughs> Denny's. <laughs> There's a Denny's in Laguna Hills about five years ago. They went at it. <laughs> were you <laughs> standing outside of a restaurant with like a thing of popcorn? <laughs> a rabbit hole. Well, no, that was uh, on YouTube. Just flicking you quarters in the floor. Go at it. Just because, and I think about it, I'm like, wait a minute, that makes sense. Because when I was young, 
we'd all go to Denny's, kind of like to sober up a little bit. <laughs> and so if <laughs> alcohol's involved, time. then yeah. what are you looking at? You know, but now it's different. Now kids are just like re- recording everything. So you're more in each other's business. Before, everybody would just sit in the group, talk about the night, and then go about it. But Yeah, it's almost like the phone is already going. Sometimes yeah. I see these these cameras, and they were already busy recording something. And that's how much people are using their phones, that they're catching the beginning of the fights. Mm-hmm. Crossover, man. You know, years ago, you didn't catch the beginning of the fight. It, like, started halfway through the fight was already going. Now it's like they're really catching, like, even the guy talking to the other guy, the start of everything, the guy getting off his seat. I mean, you get the whole synapse. Well, that's another thing is on the subways, people start recording and they're like, they get mad at each other. They get mad and start <laughs> confronting people. Why are you recording? That's whatever. how I almost got in a fight. Cause really? Yeah, I was recording because uh, I li- lived in New York for a little bit. And I think, it, back to what you guys were saying, what, it, what my theory is, it's space. It's like rats in a maze, right? You put that many rats together. It's not that a stereotype like, oh, New Yorkers are... Uh, New Yorkers are my favorite people. But I think when you put that many people together, it makes it a little crazy. And I remember it was... It got to the point where it was like a record. The, the trains were low, so it felt like one of those trains in India. I never experienced that before. My, I got a, and I just think of a, not Snapchat, but what if Vine just came out? I'm like, I gotta find this, right? And I'm like doing it, and this guy's like, hey, he just got really mad at me next to me and just made a big deal, and we almost got into a fight about it. And just, just from me just filming. You were just recording how tight you were in, in the. Yeah, it wasn't like train. right in people's faces, or whatever. It was just, it was just showing the, the door. What did he say? What was his complaint? He's just like, hey, why are you recording? Put that, put that s away. And uh, I, I have a weird. What did you say? I have a weird gear where I go from real nice guy to I have my own complex and issues come out and they they they, they the glasses themselves. come off. Yeah, I didn't have, I, I, oh, did I have glasses? No, I didn't have glasses. You turned into a thirty-two year old yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, like Clark. No, no. So what happened? I think crazy sense crazy pretty much, and he just backed off because he's just oh this guy's an, you know crazy people can smell other crazy people. He's like oh yeah, this guy's crazy too. Whatever. Here's the trick, Dan. If you're ever gonna film stuff, mm. just talk to your screen as you're doing it. So then when somebody goes, what are you filming? I'm talking to my mom, and then you just go like this. But that's you're really true. filming. That's true. That's how you get away. Man, yeah. Ghost, Ghost sure. got all the sneaky tricks. The m- hey, mom, go check on the laundry. I just heard that thing. Yeah. Hey, talk to your talk to work. your mom on the phone while you film other people. Yeah, you <laughs> just talk as you're. doing One other tip too: good. if you film <laughs> a street fight story, do it sideways. Because mm. when you load it to Venmo <laughs> guy, and YouTube, he is the guy on the your level. Big, your fans or, or viewers they will appreciate it better. Otherwise, that big Half block comes out where it's black. Yes, and then there's only the the, the middle deal. So mm-hmm. do it sideways, and uh, it'll be a lot easier. That I, feel, I feel like George is an that's instigator true. over here. I, th- I think he's. I think it's where he spends his free time, guys. I think he's. he's oh, I get caught up in that. I get caught up in that. I won't <laughs> deny it. All right, but let's talk a little bit about um, going back to MMA. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's talk about some MMA. Uh, this past week, well, yesterday, yesterday, out in Hamburg, Germany, we had a card, and it ended with a vicious KO in the main event, which I want to talk about. But before that, I think the UFC broke a record or tied a record for most consecutive fights that went to a decision. It was tough at times. It you know, was tough, yeah. I want to see a result. I don't want to argue over who won. I'd rather just clearly know who won. Like in Anthony Smith and Shogun Hua, nobody has a problem with who won there, right? We all know who won We're that fight. We're all pretty sure. Anthony Smith, the, I mean, he, he really blasted um, Mauricio Shogun Hua in round one. And I knew it was coming just from looking at Shogun Hua. He... Did he even train? I mean, I know he's getting older, and he's not going to look like he did in Japan, pre-Sada. Say what you will. But still, man, there's a lot of other fighters that still look great um, post-Usada or but post-Japan. It, it, yeah. He just looks sloppy. And I thought, oh, man, the, did you even train? Are you ready for this? You can't just show up and say, I'm Shogun and expect to win fights. And he's won three in a row. Four in a row is like, I think that would be the, the guy in the light, light heavyweight division with the most wins at that particular time. And, and Daniel Cormier had been saying his name, you know, leading up to this. And it, it all didn't matter. Anthony Smith waxed him. Gosh, Anthony Smith, when, he's ca- when he came out and he just, like, got in the cage, man, his, his demeanor and his eyes were like, they were, they were focused and locked in. I mean, he looked like a caged animal for real. Like, he... He was there and present in that moment. And when Mar- Mauricio Shogun Hua came out, he looked like he was coming to the office. Like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm going to a fight. I have a lot of experience in this. You have a lot of experience in it, but there is a difference between having a lot of experience in it and walking in and not being present versus Anthony Smith. He was very present. Every second, it was like, you, you. even as he was walking out to the cage to come get into the cage with him, you could see Anthony in the background 
walking back and forth, not, deter not deterred by anything. The music didn't bother him. Other people weren't talking to him. He wasn't getting, like, more corner advice. He was just zoned in. And in that moment, it wasn't very hard to see that something really bad was about to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, he was, he was just in the fight. And, and as, as a coach. Yeah, I was going to say, this is through the coach lens. You were this seeing is through this, the, This is it. through the coach lens. Mm -hmm. Like when, I, when I'm cornering a fighter or I'm, I'm watching one of my fighters, I think every coach that, that has been inside the cage long enough, you start to be able to look almost into the soul of your fighter or into the soul of another fighter. You like look into their eyes and you can see something very deep going on there. Because we spend a lot of time looking at one another, like right into each other's eyes, and we go, oh man, where are you at mentally and emotionally? You have to be able to read that. Like, are you, are you saying you're okay, but you're really not okay? What is it that you need right now? Because not all men are great at telling somebody what they need or asking for help. So you get better at reading your fighter. You get better at looking at them. And I'll tell you, when I saw Anthony Smith walking out and when he was standing there and they put the camera on his eyes, it was like, oh, my gosh. This guy, if this guy stays with his mentality and he stays with the eyes the way that he has them right there where he is just locked in to – to, you know, I, 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 like the energy of what fighting is or like the what it actually is, that, that piece, and he stays connected to that, he's going to be a UFC champion. It's the way that he's fighting. It's the way that his eyes are locked in. It's the, it's the emotional space that he's living in right now in his life. You could see it when he was in the cage. And when he, when he fired, I mean, a guy with that, those kind of accolades, Shogun Hua, that's a scary highlight to sit there and watch inside the UFC when they play it for all the fans above you. His eyes were not deterred at all. Like he, you saw what he did to Rampage Jackson. That looked right. really scary. Mm -hmm. Right? And he's like, Chuck. I'm, about to, I'm about to run through this guy. Right. Leoto. And that is, that is something to, s to see. I mean, it is, it is a scary thing when those, when those UFC producers. Oh, you meant what Anthony did to Rashad. No, I'm... What Shogun did to Rampage or what Anthony what, did to Rashad? What Who's Shogun did to, yes. did to yeah, Rampage. Yeah. That was scary. I want to take it from there, and then we'll chime in on the fight and the result. It was, it was quick, a minute 29. We'll have all the guys chime in, but I want to take it from there. Not only did I see what you're describing, but after the fight, how smooth was that guy? Wow. He already called out Alex Gustafson <laughs> for UFC 227 and made it sound like... What is it, 13, 14 days away? Like, no problem. I'll see you there, buddy. You know, all calm, <laughs> yeah. cool, collected. And then when I hear Gustafson pulled out, of course I'm not going to say anything bad about Gustafson because I don't believe that he pushed out. But no. with him just withdrawing himself, <laughs> you know, it, it almost seems like he watched it and said, uh-oh, I better, I, I better, not, I better uh, lose sight of this guy for now, you know. Y yeah. But Anthony Smith was cool as a cucumber pre-fight, during the fight, and post-fight. Yeah. I, Kudos to him. I have a lot of respect for him. Yeah. Really? Uh, what do you think of the fight? What do you think of the result and the way it went down and that brutal KO? And uh, y if you saw, Goddard had to hold up Hua just in the process of falling mm -hmm. and then trying to stand back out. I mean, he was out on his feet, out on the ground, out on his feet. Took a while. Uh, I thought Shogun did look a little different, but he's looked like that before in other fights. I I just think it really came down to Anthony. That Smith's flabby skill. though, he was flabby. I mean, he's done that before though. But Anthony Smith, I mean, if. If you watch everything he did, you can tell that he watched a lot of tape on Shogun because he was able to avoid his shots and pick his shots at the right moments yeah. and use his distance. And every time he was getting closer and closer, you could just see it happening. And uh, I, I think I give him all the credit. I, I think that could have been a Shogun that was on point. I think he still would have had some problems. Yeah, I'll just keep it to one point on each guy. Uh, Shogun, uh, about the... The, the, the flabbiness uh, and whatnot. You know, I, I think, you, like Gosa, we've seen it before to where now when you look in re retrospect, how much of it really was the knee injuries even when he was, you know, healthier in his prime because he was having these issues before, you know, his he got the title while he was still in his prime. So perhaps there was a commitment issue there. We've seen it before, you know, and other guys like uh, greats, like even like BJ Penn or whatever, they're their own worst enemy sometimes is himself in the prep room. And I'm sure you, you, it, you as a coach, you – you, you see versions of that and of course and, and try to nip that in the butt of course as your job if it's one of your guys but you're familiar with these things and uh it, it could have been that and you know the, the dc news did drop but it was probably only like what two weeks or a week from this fight so most of the prep was probably already in the bank and in fact at his age he was probably already winding down sparring by then 
Um, Who, Alex? Uh, uh, no, no, a Shogun. Shogun. Oh, no. So I don't know how much he could have turned on the gas with the extra motivation. So yeah. that, that was part of, part of the reason why I picked Smith. And I, I've been a big fan of Smith. So all I'll say about Smith is from the John Morgan story, you know, that, that's our MMA junkie. You can go search for that about Smith being in an airport. And it was like, you know, had more losses than wins or something at the time. Said, I'm going to be in the UFC. And John Morgan's like, sure, kind of like, all right, man, all right. And next thing you know, he's there. And then even there, he hasn't gotten a lot of, like, respect from odds makers or critics. And so to see him just kind of step up with the weight class and perform like this, it's, it's hard not to be happy for a guy like that. To see a young journeyman, you know, have to go through real tough swings early in the career, stay with it. And well, look, I feel like you guys might be giving him a little bit of a pass, but I have to really bring this back up. I... I've heard from someone in the Shogun camp, and obviously I can't disclose the name, but somebody that would know. Mm -hmm. right. And he's flat out told me it's just tough to get Shogun to practice. Yeah, I heard that too. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, and too, and yeah. when he's there, he's amazing. When he's in shape and focused, he's amazing. But th he just lacks that motivation. Now, I don't know if it's age, he's made enough money, um, or if that's just him. I, You know, he's been one of the guys that's never chosen to drop to 185. I mean, Henderson... 205, he's fought at 185. Rashad finally made it to 185. King Mo, he's going to make it to 185. Lyoto Machida, they all eventually said enough is enough. These guys are big dudes. You know, I thought after Vitor. John Jones, Vitor, I thought after John Jones, you know, he would have made it down. Um, he, he, he never chose to. Now, granted, again, he had a turnaround where he won some fights, but I've seen Shogun look soft. Nothing wrong with that. Sometimes you're just going to have a camp where you're a little bit leaner and maybe you got more running in. Maybe one of his wheels wasn't working, an ankle, a knee, who knows what. But in this one, I saw just flabbiness. And, and it just looked like an unprepared shogun. His face, his demeanor, like he didn't. I think when he stepped in, he knew, oh boy, just the fact that I'm shogun is not going to help me here. I got I to gotta land one of these. Otherwise, that looks like a monster across across from me, you know, and and that's why I think the result was the the way it was. And what's unfortunate, Dan, I agree. He just found out DC, you know, has been calling his name out a couple weeks ago, but he didn't just find out that he has a three fight win streak oh, yeah. and that he's 36 years old and that this could be it, like as far as a final run, because DC could just vacate the belt and guess who would be one of the f one of the two up for uh, the vacant belt? It had it would have to be Shogun off of four wins. You know, and then getting Anthony Smith, I thought, I wouldn't say a gift, but an Anthony Smith off a not a full camp is more of a gift, you know. So I, I'm disappointed in Shogun, man. Right. I, I really thought he could have done something else at this moment in his career, and it just it just didn't work out. Now, just for the record, what? Sorry, I just want to say for the record, I wasn't giving him a pass or anything. I'm just saying in my, my research, I heard those same things, and that made me lean away from him. And then also going, well, maybe he'd get more motivated if the DC news, and then I just did that math. That's, yeah. that's the only reason why I was saying that. Did but you I, think I agree. Tabora was pass, a little bit more flabby than usual? That's hard to say. He's a guy that carries around a lot of extra body He fat. looked he a little bit more types. soft, too. And he, I'm watching this because I bet on these motherfuckers. <laughs> I have no problem admitting it. They're not right. big bets. They're just parlay bets. For, for me, they're there's big money bets. money involved. Rent needs to be paid, goddammit. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, as soon as I see the fighters, because all that stuff is just behind the curtain. Yeah. After they weigh in, you start to kind of put two and two together or whatever. But as soon as I started moving them, I, I saw Tabora. I've seen him look leaner. And I go, oh, boy. You know, and Struve was looking focused and... You know, he's got such a long range. I didn't think I was going to get out of there with a win. I was lucky to get out of there with a win. Right. But, but uh, that's why I think on Shogun, I've watched him over the years so many times, and he just I just knew that a he was maybe 50% of what I remember. A lot of these older fighters that are – that are and by older fighters, I mean, really, 36 isn't that old. But, right, yeah. but a lot of these guys that have been in the game for a very long time, they came from a martial art background. And combining martial arts – with athletics has really only come together in the last 12 years, right? It, now it's like, hey, we want to make you more of an athlete. We want to lift more weights. We want to get more powerful. You know, you're going to go out there and look like a Tyrone Woodley. Like, before that, yeah, there were big guys, but you put a Bob Sapp in there, he was clunky and, like, moving around weird, and he was just like an ogre kind of guy right. versus a martial artist. And then it was all about technique, technique, technique. Well, guys, it's still about technique. But you older, the older dogs got to realize, too, at the same time, you got to go out there and lift weights and become powerful and become stronger. Because these young guys, they're getting the technique of the game that has evolved. And they're learning about lifting weights and running and, and getting to that next level of athleticism. And I think that's what really separates a lot of these guys. You mentioned BJ Penn, who we're talking is one of the all-time icons of the sport. But 
BJ Penn isn't doing power cleans at his house right now. We all know he's not he's not out there trying to squat 450 pounds or something along those lines. You know, he's just training jujitsu and then working on his boxing technique. But that's not enough to get you through in these weight categories anymore because you're taking these guys and they're they're more powerful their their percentages at 170 pounds. Let's say they're a 170 pound fighter. They they can go out there and power clean 2.5 times their body weight. Well, a guy like that's going to knock your head off. Where another guy, he can go out there and only power clean 1% of his body weight. You should be in the weight category down with the 135ers, but you look like you're 170 pounds. Mm. That's what I see. Sh- poor Shogun seems to be running into is he's not developing his athleticism and his strength and his power. Mm. I got a friend out here. His name's Nick Best. Is he, he the best? Nick Best. He's he is actually the best. He's the Masters strongest world man, or the Masters strongest man. You know the strongman shows. Yeah. He's the world champ of that. Like thirty-five plus or forty-five plus or something like that. Yeah. So is that from what means? yep. Right. So f- he's he's made it to the world world strongest man games like seven times, and he's placed inside the top five. He's forty-nine years old. And he's done it against any age category, right? And then in Masters, which is 35 and over, he's now the current world champion. He's 49 years old, and, and the guy squats over 900 pounds. Now, the, they've proven that your strength actually improves as you get older as a man. So your odds of becoming stronger go up. You, can, you become better. But inside of MMA, we keep talking about, well, you're not that young kid anymore. You're not those things. Yeah, but they're, not, they're also not doing the strength training and the work that is required to develop their athleticism to get to the next level. And I think that a lot of that comes down to the foundation of why you started martial arts. Let's take a quick break. Uh, we got, we're a little bit behind on that. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius XM Rush 93. Stay close. We'll be right back. Also, I don't want to take anything away from Anthony Smith. Talking so much about Shogun, Anthony Smith, you were a beast. And it's been an incredible summer for you, taking out two legends in Rashad Evans and Shogun Hua, and now calling out Gustafson, even though it's <laughs> not going to come through. That's sad, but congrats to him. We'll talk more about UFC Fight Night 138. We'll take your calls at 866-522-2846. So call in. It's the MMA Junkie Radio Show on a Monday with Ricky Lindell in the house.
the up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, start. You told me that code would get rid of them. Yeah, well, they're still here. Okay, but now they know I tried to kill them. Hold on, Mom. Here are George and Goes. With the clock ticking and All-Stars already on the move, here comprehensive coverage of baseball's trade deadline from former general managers Jim Bowden, Steve Phillips, and Jim Duquette on MLB Radio. Uh, Series 209, XM89, and streaming on your phone or at home on Series Connected Devices and speakers all right let's talk about a few other fights here and then we'll circle back to uh the main event if you guys want if you feel like you haven't given enough on that because the that that could have been a possible retirement for shogun and of course it's it's a real coming out party for anthony smith uh you can't say well you know he beat Rashad, but that's his first fight back up at light heavyweight. What's he really like now? That's two in a row. and Former he's, champions. He's looked amazing. But Corey Anderson in that same division, he defeated Glover Teixeira. Young guy got the older guy, Dan Tom. Um, Corey's turned it around, huh, since those losses to, I think it was Manua and OSP got him, and, and yeah. now he's got a couple in a row. But not just two in a row. He's looked good in those two. And Teixeira's a ranked fighter. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, man. I, uh not to tip the hand, but I was gonna say light. I think light heavyweight was the real winner of this card. When you think about yeah. it, I mean, it, it's been a. I, I, <laughs> I tweeted yesterday. I'm like, let's be honest. It's been a division that's felt like a stale swingers party as far as matchmaking has gone for the last ten years. It's been. Oh, did you fight this guy? Yeah, we fought already. Right. Oh, well, how long was it? Well, it's been long enough, and you're just doing this weight let's to cycles. Let's do and Hula. Hula oh, again. let's put the wrestlers together. Well, even when you had like you know Hendo was still in the mix. He was like the, the Henderson Machida matchups, which were uh, terrible matchmaking. That's a whole other thing. I think they did. Anyways, but uh, yeah, it's just been awful matchmaking at like heavyweight and not a lot to get excited about. Let's be honest. I'm not trying to crap on it. It's a, it was a, a trademark division for a while. Um, but yeah, Teixeira almost locked up a nice choke. I think it was in round one. But uh, other than that. Yeah, his his hips were kind of off to the side, though. It was, I mean, if he would have been underneath the choke a little bit more, I think yeah. he could have finished it. But he was off to the side because of the way the takedown ended. Right. And that kind of got him through the rest of the round. Abu Azatar defeated Victor Miranda. Uh, Martin Tabora defeated Stefan Struve. Stefan Struve's talking about, you know, not sure what he's going to do next. Oof. Danny Roberts against David Zawada. Great fight, man. Split decision, but Danny Roberts right. got the call, and I think they got it right there. Uh, Nazrat Hap, uh, Hap, Haparast defeated Mark Diakise. Uh, very entertaining fight. The, the judges had it 30-27 across the board, 130-26, but still, I thought Diakise still had some... Uh, he battled. Some, some good moments there because yeah. he's such an explosive fighter. But uh, Happer asked, man, um, I had did not really know too much about that guy, and I'm, not, I'm a fan. Attacking he looked from really every good. Angle, huh? He sure did. And this is a guy that was probably giving up five inches in reach, and he was still finding ways to get around that and attack and make his strikes count. Damir Hadzovic defeated Nick Hine. Uh, Bartos Fabinski defeated Emil Weber Meek. Unfortunate, I really wanted Meek to uh, have a better showing after the Usman fight. Because even though he lost to Usman, there's nothing wrong with that. Everyone seems to be losing to Usman. He's a force in the welterweight division. But I thought Meek had shown that, hey, anybody a step down from Usman, and I, I'm taking down a win, you know, in my he next fight. He had his moments, too. He did he have his moments. the very end. But, but Fabinski, just, 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 you know, powerful, strong, smothering. And, uh, yeah, Meek could never get going. Uh, Nad Naramani defeated Khalid Taha. Uh, Alexander Rakic defeated Justin Ledet. And, boy, that Rakic, that's another light heavyweight to keep an eye on. He was a beast. First of all, he started off with these kicks to the calf that Ledet did not like. Mm -hmm. you know. And it was basically kickboxer against boxer. And I thought that's where it was going to get settled. But Ledet, I know he has some Brazilian jiu-jitsu. But Rakic really showed off some ground and pound. Wow, I mean, this dude was a monster, and that's why you see some scores of 30 to 24. So Ledet takes his first loss as a professional, um, and his debut at light heavyweight did not go well. But between Rakic, Roundtree a few weeks ago, Anderson's resurgence, and Anthony Smith uh, going up in weight, light heavyweight it's fun Big again shifts. a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tyson Pedro is uh, a few other cats out there that that uh, you know one wants to keep an eye on, but. I know we're losing a lot of great fighters from what was once the marquee division, but uh, there's a few others to get excited about. Dominic Reyes as well. All right, uh, and then on the undercard, on the prelims, on Fight Pass, Manny Bermudez, Darko Stosic, and Liu Pingyuan. 
got wins. And there you have it. The bonuses went to Danny Roberts and David Zawada, and I thought they earned it. Fight of the night. Performance of the night, Manny Bermudez and Anthony Smith. Almost 8,000 were in attendance at the Barkley Yard Arena in Hamburg, Germany. The gate was 750,000. Fun fights on a Sunday? I thought it was a good card overall, but the pace of pacing of it, right. the decisions kind of would throw you off. Like as a, as a viewer at home, you like to have that little flow where you watch a fight and you have time to go do something and grab something and come back and watch the next one. This one was just kind of dragging on. It was really weird, but I thought it was entertaining. You like the overall. Sunday morning fights? Yeah. yeah I kinda as long as it's not football season, I think we're okay, right? right yeah, don't mess with football. Right, but otherwise, because it's fun, because it just happened yesterday. We can come in today and talk about it. Mm -hmm. I know we've talked about, uh, you know, Friday fights and different nights when you can do it, and they all have pluses and minuses. But yeah, it was all right. But I wouldn't want it. I wouldn't want it to be the norm, and I definitely wouldn't want it to be during football season. I I don't know. I'm a. I guess I'm. I'm more of a nighttime guy in general. I mean, anything that that I associate with leisure, entertainment, entertainment. I like to associate with. Like to think would be associated with leisure, uh, whether or not you're cracking one open or not. But it's kind of similar to day drinking. It's like it sounds fun. It's great. Who wants to? Who doesn't want to have a day and just kick it off like that? But you know, come the afternoon, you're a little tired. You're slogging, and then you, we might have stuff to do. It's nice to have the yeah, daytime. You didn't get, get much done. Yeah. So it's nice to have the daytime to get stuff done, whether it, it, it's work. Uh, working out chores or whatever and it, maybe my, mine's i would think mine's might maybe like media sensitive like no a lot of people would work monday through friday mornings and maybe you want to sleep in maybe and just give your body that rest and i hate to complain about this because the english mma fans are and, and are, are screaming at us like oh we have to be up early every let's stay up i don't know how you guys do it y'all are savages my hat is off to you guys i'm just saying if i have a choice as an american viewer american sports the way it's designed uh then yeah i i, I like i like the uh, nighttime more evening shows. Let's talk to Marco, and then we'll take that last commercial. Marco from Waco. What's up, buddy? Marco from Waco. ¿Qué pasa, Atos? What's up, Marco? Hey, that's Tom. What's it's up? It's Sunday. Shit to on a Sunday. It's perfect for me, and I'm mighty neat freaking uh, fights, and then enjoy the rest of the afternoon and do absolutely nada. <laughs> I envy you, brother. I envy you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm super impressed with Anthony. The lion had a smith. It's still a size, Jean-Claude Van Damme. The real lion had is uh, Anthony Smith. <laughs> and, uh, nice reference. What, what, what can I say about Alexander, the Austrian came Velasquez Rackets, man? He put a freaking kind of whoop us in just to leave that. Oof. that I did not expect that, yeah. Rackets was a beast. Yeah, yeah that guy, I, I'm going to keep an eye on that dude because, you know, he's making the, the light heavyweight division very interesting again. Mm -hmm. Give him a top 15 guy and then let, 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 let's dance with this whole thing. It's an interesting day of fight. I enjoy it. I have fun. You know, I started two hours later for me because I'm on Central Time. That's why I'm not complaining so much. Peace out. See you, buddy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, man, I'm telling you, I, I, we were saying this about, I remember a good five, seven, eight years ago on the show. I was making sure to tell the Brazilians and the Americans who were at the forefront of dominating MMA, keep pushing yourselves and that new generation stay hungry and be hungry because the other parts of the world are coming. And I knew Eastern Europe would have, well, in this case, Rakic just from Austria, so Central Europe. But I knew Eastern Europe, I knew Asia, I knew other parts of the world. Australia was going to have some mean sons of bitches that were going to come through the sport and, and wreck shop, you know. And that Rakic guy was, I mean... For one, he's a kickboxer, but I really liked his boxing. I really liked his kicks. He's in great shape. I was, you know, okay, you see the muscles. Can he? Does he have conditioning? Hell yeah, he had the conditioning. And he just has this mentality. He looked focused, you know what I mean? And uh, I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye on that dude. Yeah, definitely. I, I don't know if he was training this camp, but he's also the training American top team. He was one of... Uh Junior Dos Santos training partners for a minute last year. So I'm sure that's probably a good influence to have, too. That's a huge influence to have. I mean, one of the things that we as Americans still are holding over all the other countries out there, and I mean, probably shouldn't just be branching it out and throwing it out there to everybody, but I'm going to. I'm going to give everybody a nugget is – our folk style wrestling is still what we hold over everybody else. I mean, they, they're out there, they're doing freestyle wrestling, which means they have to lock hands. They can do the throw, but they don't have to control you once you hit the ground. You spend 20 years doing that, and now you don't really have the control and the groundwork and, and how to, like, pull somebody to the ground. Like, the fight that we saw with Corey Anderson with Glover, mm -hmm. you could see his folk style wrestling continued to break down Glover over time because when we take somebody down in American wrestling – you have to hold them down, and the other guy has to get up on his own. 
in freestyle wrestling, which is what they do in every other country in the world, once they take you down, you're only on the ground for 10 seconds, and then the ref goes, oh, stop, stand back up. So a lot of these other countries, they're, they have impeccable stand-up. They have all these, like, all these beautiful techniques that they're using, but then they get ground out by Americans a lot of the time because we have the folk-style wrestling. You have to stand up against us, and we already know the jujitsu. So that's, that's holding a lot of these other countries back. Now, these guys that are showing up over at American Top Team or like coming to train in America that already have these impeccable skills coming from these other countries, then they show up like a Khabib. He's wrist riding on the ground. He's running folk style wrestling after he has like these beautiful takedowns. You can see the influence that a Daniel Cormier has had on him or these other guys. Let me take a quick break, and then yeah. we'll continue on that. That's very interesting you bring that up. Uh, it's MMA Junkie Radio on Series 6 7, Rush 93. Stay close. We'll be right back. Blah, blah, blah. Here are those two dummies, George and Goes. All right, so, Ricky, I want you to finish your thought there a little bit about folk style wrestling. We have about two and a half minutes before we get to the top of the hour, and then if you want to speak more about it or whatever, but if you wanted to finish your thought, because I cut you off. Yeah, George, there's just, uh, there's folk style wrestling, it's it's something that you're seeing more and more in MMA, uh, uh, where it's coming more to light. When we look at the international guys, they... They haven't been bred into folk style wrestling where when you take somebody down, you have to hold them down and the other guy has to get up on his own. They, they do freestyle wrestling where when I take somebody down, after a certain amount of time, if I haven't turned them in the Olympics, you then just get stood up by a referee. And MMA doesn't reward that anymore. In fact, five or ten years ago, they started rewarding people with a stand-up if no action was happening. But now... You know, John McCarthy was a big push on this. Like, dude, if you've been taken down, you got to get up on your own or I'm not just standing you up. I've seen too many fights won that way or awarded that way. I've had him say that in our, in our back room several times. So the game is changing and has been moved to you get rewarded for the work you put in. 
And because of that, a lot of the international guys are stuck with great striking. They have a takedown, but no way to control the takedown after they've landed on the ground. And then they have great jujitsu. But they're missing the whole control aspect in the middle, the, the, the Matt Hughes or the Tito Ortiz, that even that original style we saw in America. So there's a lot of growth that has to happen for them. You can see the guys that are coming over to America to learn that. They're learning it, and they're using it in the cage. But they have to, they have to give up their whole life in their other country and move over here right. and work on it. And that's a lot. That's a lot. You've got to be committed to become a champion. Mm-hmm. Ain't that the truth. All right. Uh, we are up against the clock, so we're going to break again. And then when we come back, we'll have a nice run there. If you want to call in, 866-522-2846. Or chime in at UFC one, Fight Night 134, which took place in Hamburg, Germany, with an amazing main event of Anthony Smith squashing Mauricio Shogun Hua in the first round. KO, beautiful elbow to the temple, and then some punches that followed up that were nasty. Great stoppage there by Michael, uh, excuse me, referee Mark Goddard. Plus, this week we have UFC on Fox 28 with Poye and Alvarez. Can't wait to talk about that one. So stay close. We'll be right back. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Series 6M, Rush 93.
All right, here we go. It's the second hour of the MMA Junkie Radio Show. I got to keep it together here because uh, that song uh, is dedicated to Vanessa Salcedo. And our good friend, Big Ralph. Yeah, our good friend, Big Ralph. He lost his daughter, Vanessa, um, early on Sunday morning, so yesterday. And those two used to rock out to uh, Offspring, which you've heard of, which you've heard during the first hour. And... Uh, social distortion she will be missed and uh, I'll probably speak a little bit more on her later in the show but um, Offspring was her favorite band and we're thinking Ralph's of you Big Ralph and I know Vanessa's listening and sad sad loss alright um, let's do the daily debate I want to do that and then we'll talk a little bit more um, it's great to have Ricky Lindell in here because all the competition he's done in combat sports, all the coaching he's done, and just your piece alone in the first hour about folk style wrestling and what the rest of the world does need to do, even though they've caught up in many aspects of MMA, one should pay attention to that because as you were talking, I was thinking about some of those fighters like Khabib and Daniel Cormier and the successes they've had. And uh, But ain't that the beauty of MMA? You know, jiu-jitsu on the scene in 1993, then the wrestlers came. And the kickboxer stopped a few things there. And then the cardio machine showed up, you know, yes. and started outlasting anybody. And uh, over the years, I've seen so many things. People flip tires. People wear uh, masks. People in elevation rooms. People running hills. People running sprints on the beach. People uh, chopping wood. <laughs> or was that Rocky Three Or Rocky Four? No, 4? people chopped wood. Chop people chopped wood. I'm sure they did. But that shark was tanks. in Rocky Four. It was in Rocky yeah. Four. Shark tanks. No, we got to stay away from the shark tanks. Concussions. Weight cutting. Mm-hmm. Overload them in water. Oh, take away the IV. Like it, We continue to evolve over time, and you have to adapt. And it's just like other sports. You know, right now in the NBA, if you can't shoot the three, we're not drafting you. You know, unless you're a monster, if you're seven one, you're swatting everybody and grabbing twenty rebounds. All right, we'll talk. But other than that, they want shooters in the NFL. Speed, man, they want speed. You know, we can teach you the techniques, but we want you to have speed. Uh, and and uh, they throw the ball a lot more than they used to. They used to run the ball back in the seventies, and you had to stop that. But now you got to throw it. So every sport evolves, and this sport's evolving. But right now, I think this is a great question. Goes, you hit a home run with this. I know most of these Thanks. babies come from. Uh, from you and uh i like this one when i read it i think it was late last night i think we can have a good debate here all right three former ufc champs fight saturday at ufc calgary who has the best chance of winning we have three choices fellas uh eddie alvarez who fights dustin poirier joanna yanjacek who fights tisha torres or jose aldo who fights jeremy stevens you go first dan tom this is tough. Uh, I'm going to reserve the right to change because my analysis and my articles coming to you on MMA Junkie aren't out or done yet. But uh, my early lean, I'll say Joanna and Jacek. I, I'm a big fan of Tisha Torres, so by by no means do I want to come off as writing her off. I just feel like Jeremy Stevens is a really tough guy to bounce back at uh, from if you're Jose Aldo. And you're coming from two TKO losses. And as well on the other side of, you know, no matter who you like in Dustin Poirier or Eddie Alvarez, I think that's going to be a tough fight for both guys. They're both barely going to get out of there, you know. So I think, uh, yeah, Jan Jacek will be my answer. All right. I'm going to go with Jose Aldo. Well, nah, you're right. It is John <laughs> Jan Jacek. For sure. I was kind of feeling you a little bit. Well, let me tell you this. Alvarez and Poirier, I feel like it's a flip of the coin. It's one of those where if they fought ten times, I think it'd be 5-5. Five, five. I'm picking Poirier. I'll just go on the record right now. We're going to do a video later on regarding this. But um, I feel like that first fight, Poirier was going to outlast them until we got to the fouls. And not that Alvarez didn't have his moments because he was close to finishing too. you know. But I th- something tells me that Poirier is the one that's going to come out ahead. So I'll just save that for later on. As far as Yen Jacek and Torres, yeah, it is Yen Jacek. I think she just, somebody has her number. You know, it's Doug Rose, Nama Yunus, and everyone else she's been able to get by. She's been able to get by some great skill sets. Karolina Kovalkiewicz, Carla Esparza, Jessica Andrade. I thought Andrade was going to take her out. And uh, I, I'm just not sure that Torres has the skill set to take out um, Yen Jacek. If she had, I love her, her speed. I love her hands. And the way she explodes. But I think if she had more of that one-punch power like Rose has, 
then we're talking, but I, I think Joanna will be able to, to do it. Now, that said, I also think Jose is going to win, but uh, but I think Joanna's the more likely. Goes. If you told me they were going to have their best performances, each one of those former champions, then I would say Jose Aldo is the one that I would choose. But I don't know that that's going to happen. So I'm looking at the matchups, and I'm thinking Tisha likes to come with these round hooks, and Joanna likes to come straight down the pipe. And I just feel like that's going to happen over and over, so I'm picking you in. Ricky? You know, uh, when I think about when I think about like the different champions that we're looking at, Ioana's, Ioana's been going through a lot. I mean, she has not lost. And coming from, coming from coaching different individuals and different champions, I will tell you, there's nothing more devastating than when somebody thinks that they are unstoppable and then they get stopped twice in a row. And... You lose your title. You lose your respect. Do you lose your self-respect? Do you lose? Do you lose what what drives you inside the cage? That's that's really what I see. Joanna has to win in this fight. Is she goes? She has to put a stop to the fact that she has lost, and she has to make sure that it is not in her mindset that she, not that it is, but could be a loser, and f- sometimes. Fighters take losses way too personally. It is, you know, these losses happen in a tenth of a second. And I think that's where Joanna could be in big trouble here. Uh, she is fighting a very tough opponent, but she just lost twice. And she may not be training and thinking the same way that she was when she was the champion, before Rose dropped her. Um, you go in, you, you train because you're having a fun time. You go in because you enjoy training. You go in because of certain reasons. Um, and you act a certain way, and you work a certain way, and your whole world is a certain way. Now, when she walks into a room, she gets looked at differently. Maybe somebody pities her when she walks into train, or her family says something, or it's always being brought up. You know, you got to go out there and reshow the world. Those things really add up in a fight camp. So, for Joanna, I think she has a much tougher fight on her hands than what we're looking at in the past. I think she has to overcome... A, her own self to win this fight, and I hope she does. I really hope she does. I am going to pick Jose because he's already been through the ups and downs. He, I think, I think Jeremy Stevens is an unbelievable fighter. I mean, I, I worked with him out in Iowa back in 2007. That's how long this guy has been running around. I mean, he, he is incredible. But I do think that Jose has the better shot because I think mentally with how his camp has already cycled, they already ran through those problems of losing a head coach, then him coming back, then people retiring, then them coming back. They've kind of found homeostasis again. I don't think Joanna is in homeostasis. She's trying to find it, and I hope she does. But I think, I think the odds are against her. All right, there you have it. There's today's daily debate. Interesting, interesting things you brought up there. Uh, here are the results: 1,816 of you voted. 66% said Joanna Janjacek. 20% said Eddie Alvarez, and surprisingly, wow. 14% said Jose Aldo. Which wow. shocks me because, look, Max Holloway's a beast. I don't want to take anything away from him, but Jose still fought well in that second fight. I had seen some amazing things from Jose that I hadn't seen in years, and I almost felt like Jose could take out anyone, but on that particular night, which was Max Holloway, I'm expecting to see the same thing. It's like a little bit of hunger is back, so that that shocks me a little bit. But anyway, the results are what they are. All right, let's continue on here with the show. Dan, Tom, you said you got a couple for Ricky Lindell. Go ahead. Why don't you fire off some of your questions that you have for the noted MMA coach? Oh, yeah, just I, I really like the wrestling talk earlier as far as that goes and, and kind of just, you know, uh, you know, you were you were kind of going on the lines of, well, you know, Anderson Silva and you know Brazilian guys here, or what about Russian guys here, and and not that you ever want to stereotype anything and and, and be ignorant enough to you know hold by those stereotypes as as, as laws or facts, but to better maybe kind of uh, help other people understand when you when, when you know fans of the sport even when they're just kind of watching it, because I guess when I'm watching it, uh, w- watching a lot of tape, even even me, I'm seeing a lot of this information really congruent to what you're saying. To where if we see guys in Russia, yes, there are those you know uh, Khabibs or uh, a guy on the the, the PFL uh, Beck. A lot, Magomedov is yeah. really, some really good grappling. Where once they hit the ground, you'll you'll be able to see them actually get groundwork in, hold positions, transition from strikes to submissions. But then you'll see other guys where like uh, Shamil Abdurakimov, the guy that fought Derek Lewis, uh, he comes from a, a Wushu Sanda base. And I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think a lot of it has to do historic 
history and martial arts and i think that influences the area strongest because in wushu sanda yeah it's like Ch chinese guys have it too we're like oh they're great at mixing in strikes to take down so he should be good for mma and you hear the commentators talk about that like yes that's true but if you look at it once they get them on the ground they look lost they don't know what to do there they have maybe a couple positional rides depending on what you give them but even when you turtle and give them something that's there they're not they're not putting hooks in they're not even really taking advantage of the fact and and, and returning you to the mat and punching you more they kind of let you up even yeah uh, so is that, is that there's a, there's a really there's a really distinct thing that I see. So as a as a coach, what I do is I I break down each level of positional loss, and so so an example of that would be uh, we're doing striking, okay? Mm -hmm. From there, from from the very baseline, two people step in the cage, and this is I mean this is like a good blueprint for the world. And everything I do, I coach off of these these things. You walk in. You walk into the cage. First thing you got to do, move your feet. That's the first thing. Okay. After you move your feet, you got to fight hands and fight for inside ties all the time. So you're fighting, you're striking in your distance and fighting for inside ties. After you do that, you have to have a setup. Okay. So now you have your setup. That's going to set up either you're going to get a knockout or you're going to get a takedown. Now you get a takedown. Okay. Because now you've, you've, you've set your opponent up. Now you get a takedown. Now, this is where a lot of guys are breaking down here. They got, they got move your feet. They got striking and, and set up. They hit a takedown. And then right here they go, okay, now you're on top. Now I have to get a shoulder or a hip on the mat. That's my next job. If you want to control somebody and keep them down, keep a shoulder or their hip on the mat. Now, I put your shoulder on the mat or I put your hip on the mat, then I can break you all the way down to where you can't get up. I make you less and less athletic. If you're on a hand, you're more athletic. If you're on an elbow, you're lower. If you're on a shoulder, you're on your back like a turtle. Well, a lot of these guys, they start getting taken down, and they literally give up from that position. They don't, I don't have to fight to put you on a shoulder or a hip. They'll just pull guard. Well, right there, there's about 50 million ways to get up. And 50 million things that could have been done to continue that battle, but they don't know it. So they drop all the way underneath, and they drop all the way to guard. And really, what's supposed to happen is, is now I fight you down to a hip. Then, once I fought you to that position, then you use your guard to fight the next battle, to get off your hip, mm -hmm. or to catch somebody in a submission. And then maybe I get to half guard, and crossbody, and mount, and then get your back, and then choke you. All of these are battles that are taking place, and they all run in a chain line together. When I'm coaching and I'm watching and I break down a fighter, I break it down all the way down to these fine points so that that way I can better help you in where you actually need help. And I can, I can prioritize what we actually need to work on. A lot of these guys are missing huge chunks from the folk style wrestling that they are not getting in their own countries. And the reason is it's in our educational system. It starts early. We start it. I mean, we got kids. I have kids in my Lundell wrestling program that are five years old. And they wrestle all the way through. I got, I got, I got kids that wrestled from, from seven years old. And now they're in college. And they're, they're D1 athletes going all the way through. Well, for a kid like that, he follows this exact system. Move your feet inside ties setups shots now break them down to a shoulder keep breaking them down to a hip then get them on their back it's very easy for him for me to work his mma game after that mm -hmm. if they followed a certain chain of events yeah now these other countries they're going to be stuck in a weird spot because yeah you can come to america and learn like you could come intern with me for a couple years and learn a lot then go back and then teach it to your guys but how many guys can you teach how many guys can you personally teach inside of two years, three years, four years, five years? It has to be pushed into your culture. In America, we got, yeah. we got 400,000 wrestlers inside USA Wrestling right now, and they're just learning it. These kids, are, these kids aren't even going to do MMA. These guys, these guys are getting degrees, and then they're going to go hang out, and we're going to just kind of see them around, but they're really going to be an accountant. I mean, we have a ton of tough guys that follow this chain of event. Now, for freestyle wrestlers... And this is, guys, outside of America, this is everywhere, Yeah. period. For freestyle wrestlers, it's, it's move your feet, setups, or move your feet inside tie, set up, take down, then they're going to stand you back up.
So now we're missing all of the breakdown parts and all of those other things. And the way that I broke it down earlier, if you want to know the defensive side of it, you have to work the exact same chain that I just said mm -hmm. in the opposite direction. You got to get off a hip or a shoulder. You got to get them off your wrist. You got to get your base back underneath you. You got to get to your stance. You got to clear the hands and turn around. I mean, there is a whole slew of things that have to be developed for these guys. Yes, there are guys like Anderson Silva. His jujitsu was able to carry him through long enough. However, we did see if he didn't lock that triangle against Chael Sonnen, he would have been in real, real trouble. Right. You know, I mean, he would have been in in a spot that would have been very dangerous. And I, I, Anderson Silva came into town, and I worked with him on folk-style wrestling. This was, man, 2000 and probably 11 or 12. And You just ran into each other, or you guys actually booked that? No, Lor Lorenzo Fertitta introduced us, and then, and then we started training downstairs in the Red Rock, like under the Bat Cave. And, mm -hmm. and uh, like the Noguera brothers were down there, and we would just work on wrestling. Like we were working on folk style wrestling and how it tied into jujitsu. And it was, it was unbelievable how, how much was not known even by the Brazilians at that point. Like what, what hadn't been... Mm -hmm what hadn't been shown. And, and uh, at that point, I was black belt in jiu-jitsu. I think I was a first-degree black belt by then. And, and I, had already, I had already put world championships on myself, so they wanted to know what I was doing. But what really kind of separated me from everybody else was that I had done the jiu-jitsu first, and then I went into wrestling. Mm -hmm. So then it gave, me, it gave me this new way of learning about wrestling. It was like... I'm seeing these guys in Brazil, and they go, man, how the heck am I going to learn wrestling? I think it's just about being strong, and they're just stronger than us, and that's what's going on, when really it's not. It's, it's so technical, and there's an order of operations that has to be performed in order to be successful at it. These other countries are going to be behind us unless they culturalize it, but it's very difficult to put that in your culture. I mean, you have to get enough Well, teachers. you saw the Gracies. Yeah. They started teaching in the mm -hmm. early uh, 1900s, right. and a whole century later, you know, we have oh. a family of Gracies, right. but a yeah. ton of Brazilian mm -hmm. Jiu-Jitsu practitioners. Right. I would say in the 80s is when that those trees started growing even outside the family. Yeah, so definitely. Imagine learning what you're saying and then going back. I mean, we're talking about two, three generations maybe before it can be ingrained. And we are going to see some incredible guys like the Conor McGregor's. We're going right. to see some. We're going to see some. Khabib's, yeah, yeah. he shows up here and he yeah. worked on his wrestling. He already had great wrestling. So his, his line of learning the next step was less. Mm -hmm. But imagine not having any wrestling. Yeah. And you have a black belt in jiu-jitsu. You have incredible striking that nobody's really seen before. But now you get to the UFC and anybody can just grind you out. Right. And it's not like it's not like it can't be done or anything. That these 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 lines have been so deeply drawn. You know, like we are advancing. Sure, that narrative of ev you know everybody's getting better at everything now. Like that is true. Sure, to a certain extent. But it, it is rare though when you think about it. You know, the, the way you're explaining it now, because it's true. Um, you know, the guy fought this this week weekend. Na Nazrat Hackpress. One of the reasons why I liked him so much is because he he comes from I believe the Middle East, but he was born in Germany. Uh, neither of those two places. Well, not, I don't want to say the Middle East, but I I believe where he was from, Kandahar. I mean, maybe not not exactly on the wrestling map. And sure enough, he wasn't like, exposed to any of those wrestling programs if there were any. But you watch him fight. The kid had no karate, no wrestling. And a, you have to have a prerequisite of athleticism. Sure, that, that's a yes. certain part of it at this level, obviously. But b, it wasn't that he was just sprawling when I was looking at it. It was like the, the little things that impressed me. It wasn't that he was sprawling, but it's that he was reaching and picking an ankle because he understood that if he puts strain on that lever, that that guy can only push or turn an angle so much. Like yes. that little thing to kind of going back to what Ricky was saying, where he was breaking down the step by step in these pieces. And it's true because you know, with the guy that you gave the example who went to half guard to his back as opposed to doing the one of fifty things he could have done to have gotten up to keep keep momentum into the scramble is that's the problem you're training for all right guys we're going to start from half guard today all right guys we're going to start from side control today and the problem is is that gets instilled into you yes and and, and and rounding back to now where i'm watching footage it's not if a guy can get a triangle or a hail mary like which was great it was an amazing moment it happened on my birthday when anderson hit chael with that but it's not it, everybody can know submissions but if a guy you know like what, what ricky is saying like lever control like if if, if, he, if he's grappling if he, if he shows me through his actions that, oh, if I lift this guy's thigh, it's going to make him force to balance this weight over here, which is going to totally F up what he wants to do in the first place. 
if I see a guy do that, that is way more impressive to me than seeing a guy throw up a triangle. I'm, am I wrong there, Ricky? Or one hundred percent. That's. I mean, I think that's the more impressive part. If I was going to look at at that time period when I looked at Chael and I looked at Anderson in that fight, Anderson did ninety nine percent of the things right the entire fight. Or, I mean, not Anderson. Chael did. Right. 99% of the time, he beat every position. He controlled the top. I was like, wait, uh, so all you had to do was have a little bit more conditioning and block the triangle, and you were the world champion. When we go back to the drawing room, and I walk you back into the, into the, into the office, and we, we go over what we really messed up on in that fight, that wasn't a very long list for Chael. But if you take Anderson's list, Anderson's list was rough. I mean, I would have way rather had the conversation with Chael than with Anderson, had the losses have gone the other way. Because with Anderson, we would have been like, wow, if that would have gone the other way, we would have been like, Anderson got dismantled. That would have been the conversation. Yeah. I don't think he would have gotten an immediate title shot again. I mean, it wouldn't have gone, history would not have gone the way that it did. Um, but Anderson was fighting off his hips the whole time. We saw him fight off his hips for 23 minutes, just laying on his back, fighting from his hips. Where if Anderson would have learned just a stand-up and learned how to fight his way back to his feet, the, f the style and the skill Anderson had, he would have been so much scarier of an opponent, in my opinion. And I'm not saying Anderson wasn't a scary opponent, but I saw him get mounted like 12 times in his fights. I saw people <laughs> gain Travis confidence. Luter. Yeah, Travis <laughs> Luter got Travis them. Luter yeah, I mean, yeah. people got confidence. Like, I think I can beat yeah, this guy. <laughs> yeah. You see how he got him off, too? Just kind of like, yeah. oh, you, should, you should now get off. You know, it was yeah. like, yeah. wasn't anything fancy to it. It, it was. It, and, and because of that, I think, I think Anderson, Anderson didn't gain the clout that he really could have gained. His knockouts and his finishes were so devastating. But imagine if you would imagine if Weidman would have thought I can't take him down, or Chael would have thought, man, if I take him down, it's so hard to hold him down that I don't even want to attempt that. He would have knocked everybody out so fast. It would have been just a brutal game. But Anderson really got caught up, and if I if I'm talking about Anderson's career, Anderson he was getting taken down. And because of that, he, he developed a style where he would put both of his hands down to block double legs. And a lot of people thought he was being cocky, but in fact, he was doing double down blocks yeah. so that if you shot, he could pick you up off the legs. And to get you to, instead of shoot shots, you would start to strike. Well, he had to do that against Weidman. Because Weidman, if he would have put his hands up and started moving, he would have shot a double leg and put him right down. So if you understand folk style wrestling and you understand the laws behind it and what you're supposed to be doing, Anderson Silva started to change his entire game because he didn't have the skills to do the stand-up. His hands stayed down. He started making sure people would strike instead of shoot shots. And because of that, in the end, he got knocked out. Mm. And it hurt him because he was missing the skills for the stand-up. So these things kind of play into your game for a long period of time. I bring that up, George, because we were talking, well, what about like an Anderson Silva? And Anderson Silva, he was able to learn enough to nullify things to get back to his feet. And he was, but eventually it caught up to him. And I think these other countries, and I think, I think a lot of fighters just in general, maybe they just go to a jiu-jitsu school or they just go well, to a striking what school. What I did mean, though, was oh, tell if me. Chael was more devastating from the ground and pound, oh. then Anderson would have been done in round one or round two of the first fight. But Agreed. Anderson had a good way of controlling you with his hips, his guard, even with his, uh, his guard uh, closed, mm -hmm. which everybody teaches you, open it up, uh, you know, because otherwise, the ref I mean, nowadays, the referees aren't going to stand you up yeah. if you lock your guard. They're going to tell you, you need to s do something to try to get because up of so we can put the onus on the guy on top. But Anderson would be on the bottom, and even when you tried to do a can opener, he wouldn't open his legs up. He was there. He would tie you up, and you really... There, I mean, a lot of times you, you win fights, Tito Ortiz, you know, just by cutting you up yeah. and bloodying you up. Yeah, yeah. And you couldn't even get that on, on Anderson. I think that's what kept him in the game because mm -hmm. he knew, well, five minutes later, where we, start on, the we feet, start on our feet. And we got five of these because I'm a champ and you got to go 25 minutes with me. But, yeah, I guess that is the one fight where none of that shit was working for him. That's for sure. It was, Yeah, it was just really rough for him in that fight. But I, th I think, I mean, going back to Anderson, he's, I mean, he's... He is such an incredible fighter. Like, right. don't don't let any of my breakdown take away right. from oh yeah, like yeah, really yeah. who uh, he was sure. and yeah. what he did and what yeah. he offered the sport. Just more talking about what what you know doing doing folk style wrestling the right way 
does for a fighter and what it can do for a culture. I mean, they did a breakdown, fighters only. They did a breakdown a few years ago on where the 150 top fighters were. And over 100 were in America when they broke down across the board. Americans or uh, just uh, Amer- training in America? Americans. Oh, wow. And then they did, it was like 26 Brazilians, and then they had a few Japanese, and then they had a few Europeans. But the, the thing that, that when you read through the names, which, which showed was they were all these folk-style wrestlers. There were so many folk-style wrestlers inside of the American culture. And, and they kind of can create a glass ceiling for a lot of these other countries right now, unless they're fighting each other so that that way they keep the folk-style wrestling out of it. Yeah. You, can, you, you really will see these guys, they're going to fall in and they're going to go against maybe like an Andrews and they're going to get just dismantled. Let's take this quick call here from Cordrick in Arizona. Hey. What's up, Cordrick? How are you Good, man. And you? Thank you, Boston. Sorry, that's the work. That's the grind. Cordrick, we can barely understand you. Do you have a pillowcase over your head? or? Are you eating a sandwich right now? I was going to say sandwich. Cage that Nick's eating a sandwich. Oh, no? he's gone. Ah, right. uh, uh-huh. looked like he dropped. I could barely understand. He sounded muffled. What? We have a question from one of our listeners. That yeah. He wants to know. His name's Basil from Las Vegas, and he wants to know, uh, could you be the vo- one of the voices to help get jiu-jitsu into the Olympics? We've been talking about wrestling and how much, how popular it can be. Uh, how about jiu-jitsu? What would it take? So jiu-jitsu is actually up to be in the Olympics, and, and it's, it's something that a lot of people don't fully understand how it works. But the Olympic Committee already has a demo sport set up under – United World of Wrestling, UWW, and it used to be FILA, F-I-L-A. And, and underneath that, so that is the Olympic umbrella for all international wrestling styles, period. So judo's in it, grappling, which is no-gi no gi jiu-jitsu, uh, freestyle wrestling, Greco-Roman wrestling, they're all in it. But the real problem that's going on is everybody inside the jiu-jitsu community is going off to the IBJJF, which is the International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation. Mm -hmm. That is a privately funded organization on its own that was built on their own in Brazil, ran by Brazilian heads, and it has nothing to do with the Olympics. They'll never go to the Olympics under a private banner that has nothing to do with the Olympics. So if you want Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in the Olympics, you got to start getting involved with UWW, you got to start getting involved with the actual Olympics. And stop, stop spending your tournament dollars and spending your tournament times over at these private organizations that have nothing to do with the Olympic Games. you gotta, you got to get involved with UWW and get involved with grappling there. And worldwide, it's bigger. UWW is bigger than it is in America right now. In America, we're all following the IBJJF, mm-hmm. and so is Brazil. But the Russians... The, the, all the Europeans, all the Canada, everybody, they're all creating world teams and they're all competing all the time in UWW under grappling. I mean, there's, I fought John Kavanaugh under, under FILA slash UWW, it's UWW now, but I fought John Kavanaugh, who's the coach of Conor McGregor in 2008 when he was on the Irish world team and I was on the American world team. There's no world teams under the IBJJF. Yeah. There's no, there's no way for us to ever enter the Olympic Games as long as you continue to push your dollars into that, into that group. Who won? I, I beat John Kavanaugh. I caught him in a straight ankle lock in 38 seconds. And, and uh, I did it right off a takedown. And so, and we have like, it, it's amazing, but years go by and him and I have an incredible relationship because we were on world teams together, we write back and forth on Instagram. We just keep in contact with one another because uh, you battled each other years and years ago. Right. And um, I just think the world of him and what he's done. I mean, it's just so cool that we're both at the forefront of MMA and doing these things. And he's, he has guys like Conor McGregor out there doing what he's doing. Like, I am so impressed and proud of what he's been able to accomplish in the world of MMA. But to go back to that question, guys, you want you want fee- you want this to happen? Jiu-Jitsu to move into the Olympics? You want to be a part of that? You got to stop focusing on the IBJJF and private organizations that are just 
organizations that take your money, and you got to start putting it into the actual Olympics, which is UWW. All right. Breach. you got to take a break here. It's the second hour of the MMA Junkie Radio Show. We have Ricky Lindell in the house. So give us a few minutes. We'll be right back after this break.
day, your life will be a lot better. Here are Gorgeous and Goes. It's fantasy football season, and Fantasy Sports Radio is helping you win. Listen to the best fantasy football analysts for expert advice you can't hear anywhere else. Learn winning strategies and find out which players you need to have on your fantasy football team. Be the most prepared player at your draft with Fantasy Sports Radio, Sirius 210, XM87, streaming on your phone or at home on Sirius XM connected devices and speakers. Welcome, John Morgan. What's up? How you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? Good, except yesterday, or the day before. No, it was yesterday. Hmm. John broke the news that Alex was out. I was like, oh, man, because Anthony had a great fight and a great call out. And then I see John Morgan informed us that Alex would not be able to take that yeah. fight yet. Yeah. So of course, it was actually kind of funny. Of course, not your fault, but I was like, John. <laughs> it was kind of funny because, like, uh, you know, being the logical thing. I mean, it was what a great call out by Anthony Smith. Perfect. You know? So I figured, ah, oh, what the hell? Let me let me uh, let me send old D Dub a little text and see what he's got to say. And I, I was like, well, hey, what do you think? You know, you're gonna give him the fight. And Dana texts me back. He's like, Gus is out. He's been hurt. And I was like, like, I actually had to check with other people because I thought maybe he was misspeaking. Like, no, no, no. It's he needs an opponent. Remember, he's so I actually texted a couple other people. Like, hey, Dana just said this. Is he right? Like, yeah, sorry, he's right. Like, he's out. So why was he calling out DC as a heavyweight? Well, or did I miss my timeline? Because that seemed pretty recent. Yeah, apparently this all went down on Friday. So I don't know how long he's been dealing with the injury, but because we don't even know what the injury is, they're they're not really talking about it, which I can understand. Right. But he was ruled out on Friday, so I guess he was just trying to. Keep, I mean, it doesn't hurt to keep your name in the headlines, right? Mm-hmm. Like one of those uh, maybe a uh, Tyron Woodley situations where, well, if you give me this guy, I can I can postpone it. <laughs> exactly, it's, it could right. have been one of those things behind the scenes. Yeah, if it's that fight, maybe that's maybe true. maybe this knee's all right. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> all right. Well, I I just think the world of Anthony Smith and what he's done this summer incredible. And to be able to be so calm and composed and say and, and the way he said it, because like he just made it sound like no big deal. Check one, check another guy off. Alex, will see you in two weeks. God, he seemed like a G. It was money. Was I tell you what, I, I love Anthony Smith. I actually shot a video in my office last night. Uh, Abby's been editing it, so it'll be on MMA Junkie later today. But I told the story the first time I met Anthony Smith back in 2010. I'll, I'll tell it now. I mean, we're gonna have it on the site too, but I'll tell it real quick. Back in 2010, I was sitting in the airport. I was flying home. I had just done commentary for an M1 selection event in New Jersey. I was sitting in the airport. This kid walks up to me. Big, you know, obviously physically strong kid. You know, he walks up. He was like, hey, you know, I know who you are. Just want to introduce myself. My name is Anthony Smith. You're going to be covering me in the UFC someday, and I just wanted you to, you know, be on your radar. And I was like, cool, you know, like, oh, man, this dude's kind of good-looking kid, well-spoken, has that confidence, has that drive. You know, I was like, cool, man, you know. So we just chatted for a few minutes. I was having a frosty beverage. He walked off, and I was like, okay, Anthony Smith. And obviously I didn't know who he was at that time, so I was like, let me look him up real quick. Looked him up real quick. He was five and six on his career at the time and was on a four-fight losing streak. <laughs> and yet still, he walked Confidence. up and was like, I will be in the UFC. You will be covering me. I'm like, <laughs> wow. And it's funny because normally. And now he's like 30 and 13? Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny because, you know, wow. you, you could be well, like. He has oh, fought a lot of fights. How long ago was this? What, 2010, eight yeah. years ago. Uh, it's a lot of wins. Yeah. And, and it was funny, too, because then he made it to the UFC. He got one and done, lost, had to go back on the regional scene, went seven and one while he was on the regional scene. After he talked to me, I think he went twelve and three, made it to the UFC, had one and done, was submitted, went back out on the regional scene, went seven and one, came back to the UFC. He's now six and two, including two and zero at light heavyweight over two former champions. Just what a what an awesome lesson of like perseverance and like, you know, this is your drive, this is your dream, believe in it. Don't be afraid I mean, you know, sit next to this guy who who embodies all that, but to to, to just don't be afraid to like Say what it is. I mean, you're on a four-fight losing streak, but you're going to have the balls to walk up and be like, remember my name, kid, because you're going to be covering me one day. And I'm like, and there he is. You know, just awesome, man. Happy to see you for that guy. Reminds me of RDA. Everybody thought he was kind of like a, a washed-up lightweight. <laughs> Started off 2-2. Two two. He became he came back and became a world champ, so that's Hotfield DeSanjos. And then the other one, Robbie Lawler. Remember him in the UFC? And then he went off to Elite XC and Strike Force and – He'll never make it back, and he comes back and became a world champ. So One of their biggest stars. That's why I said the, uh, the term earlier, that young journeyman almost. I don't know if that's the proper term, but that's what right. it feels like. I love those guys. You know, like like uh, the, all the names you just mentioned, uh, even though he didn't get a title, I always mentioned Masvidal. Like these guys that get a, an or- inordinate amount of experience at a young age, yeah. in or out of the cage sometimes. And uh, <laughs> and they, but, but you see him, but you see him develop, and when you see him stick with it, and then all, they're all of a sudden this like 30, 30, 31 year old, they're still in their physical prime, but they have like 30 fights, and they're sharp. It's incredible. Oh, it's well, great. I think there's a lot to be said for just the fact that years ago he had the confidence to be talking to you like that yep. and then 
And then with that being said, he was gaining the experience, but he kept the same mindset the entire time. We were talking about his eyes and how he mm. looked in the cage and, and where he was. I mean, this guy, he is so convinced as to who he is going to be. And now he's just like, oh, I just got to kind of show the rest of the world. It's incredible. And it's not cockiness. You know, it's just it's honest self-belief. I always say, you know, when you, when you spend enough time around the sport, enough time around guys, you can tell the guys that are telling themselves something to try to make themselves believe it. They, Versus the it's people that actually it's instilled it's coming in out of them. them. That guy has it, man. Yeah. That guy has it. All right. Well, I look forward to the video later on on MMA Junkie. Um, and tying a few things up here. So Smith calls out Gustafson. Yep. Gustafson, they say, is hurt. And somehow this sour DC. DC put up a post yesterday, too. And it's rare when you see something like this. But what? Boy, was it impactful. I Listen to this. DC says, Dear Alex, I don't know what happened to you. Going back to the Rockhold situation, you've always been a stand-up guy, but your behavior changed from calling out a guy a day after he got knocked out. That's what he means by Rockhold. After Rockhold got knocked out by Romero, Alex apparently called him, uh, called him out. So he says, after calling a guy out one day after he got knocked out, to offering me a fight, knowing I have a broken hand, after Volcan couldn't go, because Ozdemir was supposed to fight him at 227 in a few weeks. Now you've turned down Jan Blockowitz, turned down Khalil uh, Roundtree, uh, all while calling out all while calling for a heavyweight title fight. Now moments after Anthony Smith does his work like an animal, you decide you're hurt. Man, I respect you as a fighter. I will always be grateful for October 2015, but you and I won't show, share the octagon again. I am disappointed in who you became. You're an entitled man. I can't deal with delusional people. Good luck recovering. Our time has passed. You from the commentary team. Two things here. First of all, uh, respect and love DC, man. What he's accomplished is incredible. He does have his timeline wrong here, and I think the UFC may have dropped the ball a little bit by not late. Because even on the broadcast, if you're watching the fight, they they advertise right. Gustafson versus TBA, right? right? At that time, a couple people, but only a couple people knew that he was out. But he had been ruled out on Friday. So that's not what, – what DC is saying isn't entirely accurate. That's not how things went down. But I get it. I mean, maybe he didn't have all that information. I just think, to be honest with you, I think DC is playing the game perfectly. DC has gone full – pro wrestling heel mode and he already basically said i mean he said in that press conference he's like i fought gus we made no money why would i want to fight him again this to me is just an awfully convenient excuse for him to be like you you crazy you know i mean just like <laughs> i also <laughs> sat wrong with him with what happened with rock hold i know he's been holding on to that one for a while and he keeps repeating it yeah. um but yeah that what didn't help was the broadcast mm -hmm. and Corey anderson also alluded to it he said i think he was either asked but he said, uh, I can't do that again to my wife or significant yeah. other. Well, nobody so knew. So I'm going to rest this one out. And so when Anthony came in and said it, it was like, wow, he's taking that opportunity, two weeks notice, and that's pretty cool. So just nobody knew, but it turns out, when you talk to Gustafson's management team, uh, he was ruled out on Friday. It's just that information didn't make it out to everybody between Friday and Sunday. And so I think that complicates things. But I also think it's an awfully convenient thing for, for DC. You know, it's, it's I like think he never wanted to fight him anyway. That's what I'm saying. I think he's just Lesnar and that's it. Lesnar and Yeah, retire. I mean, it seems to be that, that it is Lesnar. Lesnar's a big money draw. I mean, that is that is a huge money draw. And as far as styles go, I mean, Lesnar's a great fight for him. With, I mean, there's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of downside for him. And he got to go to number one pound for pound in the rankings across the board. So, I mean... He's in a spot right now yeah. where... Why screw that up? Why screw that up in <laughs> any way? Why would I ever screw that up in any way? So I, I, I think on the night, because, you know, that night he was like, man, I'll defend this light heavyweight title, and then I'll fight Brock. You know, I think he was still feeling the adrenaline a little bit, you know, it's been a and then he got back home and like, wait, that would be really <laughs> stupid. I mean, what if I get hurt in the training <laughs> the camp and the fight? I don't, yeah, I don't want to go back down to 205. I think he's like, that was dumb, right. you know. This is going to be like, hey, John Jones is cleared by USADA, but he ran a stop sign on his way home. I don't like the character of that guy. I'm not fighting <laughs> John Jones. The man you've become to run a stop sign, you sick man. Yeah, it's it, that would actually it be one of less the about lesser things that John's ever done, just running a stop sign. Yeah, it seems to become it becomes less about the fighter and more about how how the honor police on how being asked to do fights is being done right now. I mean, I've seen a lot of fights be asked a lot of ways. I mean, if you're gonna fight, yeah, we're gonna fight. Like that's kind of how fights are picked. I mean, we're talking there on the subway. Somebody pokes somebody. You're yeah. in a fight. Yeah. Yeah. This Look, is how you do it. You seem like a fine fellow. Would you care to engage in some fisticuffs? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I don't want to run out of time without kind of going through the roster fighters you've worked with or currently work with. Um, Benoit. Yeah. So Goes was telling me he took a fight. I, I was not aware. But when is it? Are, are you with him or? On yeah, I I am. His his fight's coming up in the next two months. So so. Uh, 
he's uh, he's starting training camp. He's finishing up his hand injury. He's broken his hand like three or four times. Okay. I mean, poor Benoit is like. Do we know a location or anything? Or um, yeah, yeah. He's fighting fighting Robert Sanchez or Roberto Sanchez in Dallas, Texas. Oh, two twenty eight. So that's good for Benoit. That's where he lives. Yeah, it's gonna be exciting for him. He's he's really excited about what's going on there. I mean. He he really wants to get into that into that uh, next echelon where he's looking for a title fight, um, and he's got to put he's got to put one or two more together, you know, and really do something devastating to get to get in the mix right there. What about Carlos Condit? Can you give me an update there? So Carlos Carlos Condit's back in the gym and he's training. Okay. I mean, so so uh, he hasn't he hasn't booked a fight, um, but he's training. I mean, you can see him on his social media every single day. He's training. He's he's uh, texting me back and forth. He's going to come out to Vegas. We're going to do some work. So I'm excited for big things coming up with Carlos Condit. Okay. And then how about Ronda Rousey? Do you still have any uh, connection with her at all? She's now at WWE. Uh, She's retired oh, from MMA. Of course. And me and Ronda are, and, uh, and Ronda are really good friends. And recently inducted. So, yeah, do you still maintain? Yeah, of course. I mean, me and Ronda are really good friends. Me and Travis Brown are really good friends. Uh, we... We've been filming her uh, her actual judo, all of her judo techniques that that she does. Uh, we we're putting together an archive, her and I, for her for her website at rondarousey.com. So oh cool. So I've been flying I've been flying out to to their house in California, and we we've been technique breakdowning everything she does in judo to to teach the world. Oh, so cool. so that's been really Are you cool. Flying flying across the room. Or is she throwing you around? Oh yeah, she's launching me, okay. guys. She's launch <laughs> like some some of these. Sometimes you know she does a technique, but she you have to do certain techniques with a certain amount of power. Right. Man, she can launch you, bro. Like when you hit the mat, it is. If you don't know how to fall, you could really jack yourself. I, I it's impressive, and and the wide array of actual techniques she knows. It's. It's not just what you saw in the UFC when it was no gi. I mean, when you put on a gi, she has handles from everywhere that she can she can do things with. It's it's something special. Well, so she used to do open workouts and like watching her flow, just having fun. Oh, dude, it's amazing. So beautiful, it right? It's, it's incredible. So that's been exciting. Me and Rhonda have been putting that together, and and uh, and then I I wrote a book. I wrote oh. a book. It's it's going to print in the next in the next month or so. So that's really exciting. It's on one uh, percent better every day. It's a it's a book about it's a book about squatting actually like my squat journey where I did 500 days in a row maxing every single day, and uh, but really the book is about your best your best is in front of you it's not behind you if you work to get one percent better every single day no matter what you're going through you will make marked improvements in your life so the book is it it talks about squatting it gives you gives you things you can do inside of your weightlifting or squatting but really it goes through the journey of of self-improvement and betterment and uh i've been writing that book for the last four months and uh it's it's phenomenal it it comes out in the next six weeks very cool so it's it's at layout right now and then it goes to publication goes to print so that's pretty exciting awesome so those are the things i've been having you back and we can talk about the book i would love that I would love that, guys. All right, let's get one more break in, and then we, uh, we've got to finish up with some calls. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Series 6 7, March 93. Stay close. We'll be right back.
Passion, common sense. These guys have none of that. You listen to them, so you're no better. I am awesome, though. They are gorgeous, George and Goes. With the clock ticking and all stars already on the move, here comprehensive coverage of baseball's trade deadline from former general managers Jim Bowden, <laughs> Steve Phillips, and Jim Duquette on MLB and Network Radio Series 209 XM89, streaming on your phone or at home on Series XM connected devices and speakers. All right, let's finish up with some calls here. We are going to commit to a few minutes of overtime, so uh, we'll make sure we get all the news out there of what's been happening here in the world sport of mixed martial arts. Don't forget, this Saturday on Big Fox, UFC on Fox 28 with Dustin Poirier and Eddie Alvarez. Jose Aldo's back as well against the hard-hitting St uh, Jeremy Stevens. And we also have Joanna Jinjacek. Is, is she back too soon? I don't know, man. Against Tisha Torres, she really, really wants that belt back. She's stopping at nothing. And that's why she's fighting so frequently. Dan in Oregon, what's up, buddy? What up, fellas? Man, did you guys catch any of the Invicta cards on Saturday night? I did. I you watched did? It. I watched it all. I did the recap for it. Ask away. The main event... Gene Yoon Frey versus Gru Sander. Ooh. The goddamn robbery, man. I don't know what the hell all those judges were watching. It was a unanimous decision robbery. It was freaking nuts. John, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, well, listen, I, I did the... <laughs> I hate throwing out the term robbery because it was a close fight. The 49-46 card I thought was obscene. I will say that. Uh, was but it a pickpocket? I was. Yeah, it was. It was more of that. More, you okay. know, I was. Uh, I, I was a little surprised. I thought Grusander had done enough to win as well. Uh, I, I was a little bit shocked. The 49-46 was outrageous. Yeah, the 49-46 was ridiculous. If anything, it was four to one. The other girl. It was like, well, did, did you just march and chicks down wrong? What? What the? Even, well, even Jin Frey afterwards admitted, because I, I thought the same thing. The first score they read was 49-46, and you're like, it's a pretty close fight. Like, the first the first two rounds I thought were pretty clear for Grusander. The second two rounds were pretty clear for Frey, and then it was, and then it came back, you know, comes down to the fifth round or whatever, um, which was a, a little closer. Um, but I thought the same thing. Like, when they read 49-46, I'm like, well, you know for a damn fact that she won the first two. So, yeah, it was pretty pretty crazy. John, when we redo our logo... Can I submit Dan to be part of it? This dude does not miss anything. Like Jerry West is the NBA yeah, logo? He is you want an Dan MMA to be the junkie? junkie? He does not miss every week he calls in. Have you seen Tijuana Bash 4? Like, I mean, that <laughs> sounds like a porno, but you know what I mean. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's great. Never heard so of laugh like that. Me a solid, you want to do me a solid, George? Send me my MMA Junkie of the Month Award mug. That's what you can do. And... Last thing, man, ABC is probably sailing off into the sunset. It was amazing, ACB. I love what you're doing. I want you to live on in the hardcore uh, mind, though. So, UFC, how about you bring in the stoppage bonus? And everybody, $20,000, whenever they get a stoppage, we won't get a UFC record of nine decisions in a row and lose all the freaking viewers. What's going on, UFC? Just bring the stoppage bonus. Make the hardcore fans love you. Back to you guys, I'm out. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, didn't Victory Fighting Championships have something yeah, like they that? Yeah, well? they did thirds. Win. Thirds, yeah. Yeah, you get your show, yeah, win, and finish, and it was all in thirds. And it was working. They, they had a good rate. All right, so Showtime in Tennessee. Hang on. We'll get to you. Series 6M audience, more combat sports entertainment headed your way. Look out for the Luke Thomas Show. Uh, MMA Tonight, Busted Open, At the Fights. We got you covered when it comes to pro wrestling, boxing, and MMA. Uh, if you want to catch any of our overtime, head on over to youtube.com forward slash MMA Junkie Video. We'll continue there for a few minutes. Las Vegas turning day into nighttime, turning night into daytime. If you see it once, you'll never be the same again. You guys, are clear for overtime. Before you screw it up all week, it's USC on Fox 30. 30? Okay. Yeah, not 28. What's 28? <laughs> I actually a few looked at ago up. in Boston or something. Like USC that. on Fox twenty eight was uh, last February was at Emmett? the Amway Center. Yeah, Emmett and Jeremy Stevens. Okay, yeah. UFC on Fox thirty on Saturday. They start two hours earlier and they're on Big Fox. That's channel eleven. If you're in SoCal, channel five. If you're here in Las Vegas, my bad. All right, let's continue on here with Showtime from Tennessee. What's up, Showtime? It's yo time. 
Hey, and what's going on, fellas? Ricky and John, and what's going on? What's up? What's up? Nothing much. Hey, Rick, I want to thank you again, man. I, I happen to be have the pleasure of coming over to Bishop Gorman when you guys brought the junkies over, man, and a couple of years back, man, and we had a, a blast watching uh, Mir and uh, Big Hopper train over there. You know, just going through your classes and watching you do your routine on the ball, man. That was some exciting shit, man. You, you're very, very athletic. I ain't trying to blow your horn, man. I, I played ball at the college level and saw some great athletes, man, but you're damn athletic, man. Hey, I really, I really appreciate that. I've spent a lot of time trying to develop my athleticism, so, so I appreciate you saying that. Next time, maybe, maybe this next year when we do the MMA junkie thing again, we'll get you guys back out. It was fun. It was fun to have everybody at Gorman. Yeah, it was a blast, man. Thanks again. Cool, cool. Hey guys, I, I want, we had a little discussion, man. We were watching the fights, man, um, this weekend, and we were just kind of talking about. Fighters, you know, having kind of low fight IQ, and we were talking about the the Mech fight, man, with just kind of what he was doing, and which fight? We just kind of questioning his fight IQ. The the Mech fight with this really was the real Mech. Oh, you know, real Mech, that's right. Me. Yeah, yeah. Just you know, from the beginning of the fight, of him coming out with that flying, you know, tipping that that flying knee, kind of at the beginning of the fight, and this is like his fight IQ really just, you know, I don't know. We were just questioning a little bit, and I know you guys. You know, probably the ones to, to ask as far as, you know, as, I hate to criticize fighters, you know, because that, that's a hard-ass job they do. But we are just questioning just some of the fighters' fight IQ. Yeah, it's it's crazy with the meal because I mean he's he's been out here in Vegas and I mean I, I I met the guy a couple times and and before he was even in the UFC and the dude works his ass off. I mean that was a questionable decision and I don't know if that was like he actually thought about it and was like, dude, I'm gonna just shock everybody and come out with a flying knee or if just the the heat of the moment got him. Uh, but yeah, I mean if if the entire basis of your game plan is you need to make sure you do not get stuck on your back. I would say wildly running at somebody and throwing a flying knee is not the best way. Because I mean, yeah, we've seen some pretty incredible knockouts via flying knee, you know, over the course of history, but I'd say 90% of the time, it's like you just kind of end up bumping into somebody's chest and then you're you're off balance for a second as you get down, and that's exactly what happened to him, you know? So I was shocked, but it was alarming to me, and it concerned me for his future growth because physically you look at the guy and you can tell he's strong, he's powerful, he's got a great look, a great image, you know what I mean? He's fun, um, but, man, his wrestling skills are not developing. I mean, he was just taking down – Almost at will. And uh, and you know he works on it. I mean, there's a reason he's coming out here and, and grinding and putting in the work, but it just didn't translate. And that's that's concerning uh, for his future growth. I feel like even with the flying knee, because he bounced off kind of his back, right. he still had time to kind of set. I just think his defense is just not there. Did you catch that fight? No, I didn't. Okay, so, so I would say um, what I liked when I heard about Damian Maya. Damian Maya had, you know, awesome Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And I remember years ago him telling us that he wanted to learn wrestling because even though he could never make up those years that he didn't have, he wanted to immerse himself rather than just it's you know, today's wrestling day at yeah. so and so gym. He wanted and so he An was hour going every really, really <laughs> hard with collegiate uh athletes, uh, to the point where it was 90 days straight, and that was like a, uh, I guess, not a camp, but I him immersing himself and picking up a few techniques. And I noticed once he did that, he became he you know, such a force, you know what I mean? Because it all helped with the chain and the sequence of what he likes to do once he's on the ground. And I think that's what I would like to see more of these fighters do, the ones that learn those lessons to guys that take them down and just grind them and steal their soul. You know, they come back and go, oh, I got to work more on my defense. And I don't. I think it means leaving your team and yes. actually working with wrestlers only. That's what I would like to see from a guy like Emil Meek, who I can tell wants to improve and stay in the sport and stay in the UFC. You know, it should be an eye opener for him because he was just very clearly out wrestled. I mean, that's literally all that happened. He was just out wrestled. Yeah, and by and by a more of a judoka to guy too as well, and and a guy that was waning. Uh, you know, towards the end, they they both their gas tanks were emptying out, but you could tell that. That guy was primed to get knocked out if Emil could just keep his fight on the feet. Even though he was down 2-0, two, to oh, two rounds to nothing, he, um, he, he had a path to victory there in the third round, and it just didn't work out.
Uh, how about just overall light heavyweight? We haven't had you chime in. This was a great weekend for the light heavyweight. We had Rakic. He had a nice you win over good. Justin Ledet. Uh, we had. Ledet I'm calling needs, it. Ledet needs to go back to heavyweight, right? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's his first loss ever. But you know he needs uh, he needs more wrestling. I mean, I'll answer it for you. Him he and me to need to go and immerse themselves <laughs> in, in wrestling. Um, but the resurgence of Corey Anderson, uh, you know, he's looked good. Uh, Anthony Smith moving up, and then of course Reyes and Pedro and a few of the other guys that have just been doing the round, round tree a few weeks ago. It's exciting. You just yeah. get that gap though. It's weird. It's like you go from awesome to developing. Right. But there's nothing like in between that. Yeah, because so many guys are starting to fall out of the 205, all, all the legends of the sport. But it's a nice little comeback for that division. For sure. And then over the weekend, we got bookings for November. I'm not sure why we're not getting October yet in Vegas. We got two bookings in November. Boja Chinia, uh, Paulo Costa. He's going to be fighting Chris Weidman. And then we have Branch versus uh, Jacare. Mm -hmm. They're going to be fighting in New York. So that's already being taken care of. But I'm like... Wait a minute! You have a pay per view in October, which I can see the writing on the wall. Like John told us, <laughs> wonder what's going on on if Thursday Habib in Brooklyn. <laughs> if Habib and date. McGregor <laughs> headline that card, are they going to give us like a bunch of Dookie fights? Yes. Yes. Oh, why do we always get absolutely? That? Con yeah. if, if Connor's on the card, you don't you don't put anything else on the card. You know it what I mean? Sells itself. Yeah. Sells itself. The other thing too is uh, I don't think they want to set that precedent and let let a couple people get that taste of that Conor McGregor pay per view money because then everybody wants to be on that card. Everybody. Like, oh, when he was saying that, yeah. he stressed that, right? I don't want anybody mooching off of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, I guess I, I I guess I could see the writing on the wall. And they're already building New York, and it looks pretty good. One last thing. Did you see? Oh, Showtime. Sorry. <laughs> you want to finish up? <laughs> I'll matter that one one more thing. I think a lot of guys wrestlers suck, man. Wrestling is grueling, man. I I you know, I train a little BJJ and me being a forty four year old ex athlete getting grinded out by a twenty three year old wrestler because, you know, he was about the same size and strength with me in my BJJ class, man. That that shit's hard, man. So I think <laughs> I, is that a reason why a lot of guys don't do it and kind of slack in that department. That shit a grind. It's literally every fighter, oh. every fighter's least favorite practice of the week, and probably the most important. Yeah, I mean it's it's nonstop grueling. I mean you have to fight for position the entire time, and I think that's why they don't like it in striking. You could just take a step back for a minute, take a breath, and then step forward and strike again. In jujitsu, you can cross your legs and like hold the position for a second and breathe. In wrestling. That, that's not going to happen. You have to be fighting for a position every second, no matter what. So it's kind of the longevity of the fight that breaks people down. I just want to say one last thing here, turning to the pop culture side of mixed martial arts. Dana White threw a party for his teenage son. The tab was over a million. He rented out Dre's across the street, uh, Dre's nightclub. It's in the Cromwell Hotel. It's one of those swanky club pool scenes where you show up at 4 a.m., you know, and just uh -huh. finish out the night. So... How about that kind of loot, huh? Not going to lie, bro. If I had a half a billion in the bank, that would be like every Wednesday for me. Dude, you know what I'm saying? I'd just take a day off and just go blow a million. <laughs> roll, just roll <laughs> VIP. Just straight yeah. gangster. You would invite me, of course. Oh, I think <laughs> absolutely. You're I think invite you everybody. Are, you're a good friend. <laughs> I think 500K <laughs> would be a pretty good party. Um, over a mil. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so, uh, I mean. On a birthday I guess party. I guess On a that, birthday party. I guess that's the kind of life you leave, right? That's when you're half, awesome. halfway to being a billionaire. Good for that. Which them. I think was where Dana White's at. Yep. Mm -hmm. That is amazing, man. I couldn't believe I saw that. All right. Well, Ricky, it was great to have you back. Guys, it was great to be on the show. Thank you so much for, for having me out here. Yeah. I love MMA We'd junkie. love to have you back you uh, sometime soon, especially when the book's getting ready to, That'd to, be great. Uh, to drop. And, um, you know, keep watching them fights and keep in touch with us, please. I will. John Morgan, you head to Calgary? Yes, sir. Tomorrow? Yes, sir. All right. So we'll be looking for your coverage. Well, you got a well, tag team partner? Or yeah, the young Mike Bond will be up there with me as Mike well. Bond? So, yeah. All right, cool. So then we'll see you the following week? Yeah. Or do you so leave to, uh, leave to LA? A couple days, and then I leave. Uh, I leave. I fly out Wednesday morning to L.A., so Monday, Tuesday, next week. Simon will be assistant out there? Yes, sir. Cool. All right. Um, folks, that's our show for today. I want to thank Ricky Lindell and, of course, John Morgan for popping in. And again, I want to dedicate this show to Vanessa Salcedo, a young lady who I know very close. She's my buddy, Big Ralph's daughter. Uh, he lost her unexpectedly yesterday morning. Oh, man. So I want to dedicate this show to her. And uh, I know you were looking down on us, and we're really, really going to miss you. So we're out of here, folks. Go out there and be a champion.